Mr. Henry, would you please call uh, call the roll? Mr. Laflamme. Here. Mr. Servitanis is excused and absent. Mr. Khan. Here. Mr. McPartland. He, he's excused and absent. Okay. E email come in later. Okay. Mr. Darbino. Here. Ms. Gold. Present. Ms. Strang. Here. Mr. Drescher. Here. Chairman Walsh. Here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, Mr. Henry, sorry. Uh, let's see. We have the minutes uh, from the uh, for approval from the May 8th, 2023 uh, meeting. Do you have a motion to approve those minutes? Motion. Motion to approve by Mr. Kahn. Do I have a second? Oh, seconded by Mr. Diapino. Any changes or discussion on the minutes? I have no comments. No? All those in favor of approval of the minutes from May 8th, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No? Okay. Minutes from May 8th are approved. We have no public hearing, so we'll move right to privilege of the floor. Anyone wishing to be heard regarding any planning and zoning matters in the town of Nisk unit, please come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and we'll listen to what you have to say. So privilege of the floor is open. Yeah. Hold on a second, sir. That sounds like that. Maybe it's not plugged in. Yeah. <laughs> We got gotcha. you. Oh, it wasn't plugged in. Okay. See? All right. Okay. Hello again. Ken Schwartz, 1363 Ruckner Court. Uh, I'm against the golf course development, as you all know. My question is concerning both issues today is that um, I read last in the minutes that um, the guidelines say that you only have to design to a certain level of 50-year uh, flood or 90% flood. I can't remember what the equation was in there. And that um, it was stated that, well, even though global, global warming is getting worse, this is an odd, even though global warming is, is getting worse, and that you should maybe design it for a higher level of, of runoff. The guidelines only say you need a lower level, so you should approve it. Well, if the guidelines should be raised, raise the guidelines, number one. Number two, if you drive down Windsor Court or walk down it, if you walk, you get a better image at the, um, the end closest to River Road on Windsor there is a holding pond area, like everybody's been talking about a holding pond. And I'd say it's less than 10 years old, maybe. And if you look at the growth in there, um, it's filling in, which means the effectiveness of the holding area is disappearing. So if you have a holding area for the two house development, Pocinelli, or if you have a holding area for the 22 house subdivision, who's going to maintain it? Because once it all fills in, like all ponds fill in, it's going to be totally ineffective. And then it's going to affect downstream. And who's going to pay for the repair of all the basements and the damage? That's it. Good luck with you. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Why don't you hold a sec? Let's make sure the timer's not plugged in also. But we knew he was under five minutes, so we're good. My name is Shoshana Bule, and I live at 1119 Ruffner Road. And I read with interest the materials in the agenda statement preparing for this meeting concerning the private meeting that was held with the planning office and the town designated engineer and the applicant for the special permit, special use permit on uh, for their development on Ruffner Road. 
off of Ruffner Road. And what I noticed was the notes that were taken and reflected in that agenda statement and provided in the handwritten form revealed that there were some adjustments made in response to a certain set of town engineering comments. And we could go through and continue to make adjustments based on engineering comments for a really long time until we have the perfectly engineered piece of development. What won't be affected by a iterative process of engineering comments and re-comments is the fact that the Conservation Advisory Council issued a positive declaration here requiring full seeker review, full environmental impact statement. Adjustments to engineering will not impact the need for that. And the bulk of the planning department findings associated with this development were focused not on the deficiencies in the engineering and the sloppy work in the engineering that had been iteratively fixed over time and potentially maybe getting better, maybe being, maybe meeting some of the comments in the town designated engineer's report. But you're never going to with that, you're never going to hit a rectification of the environmental impacts and the impacts to the town comprehensive plan that are found and that were laid out so comprehensively in the draft resolution 2023-15. So I guess what I'm here to tell you today is we could listen to increasing amounts of engineering responses and increasing the amounts of money that the town can spend on designated engineers to respond time after time to sketch plans. But what we have learned is that the sketch plan associated with the piece of property that this applicant wants to develop in that area is a problem environmentally and a problem for the town comprehensive plan and engineering is not gonna fix that. So while I still feel that there are significant deficiencies in the engineering put forward so far in response to the town designated engineer's report, it doesn't even matter, it's moot because the environmental impacts will not be mitigated by increasing responsiveness to a town designated engineer's report. Thank you. Thank you. Hi again, I'm Carol Holmes, 1301 Ruffner Road. Um, I said I wasn't gonna talk, but here I am. Um, I've listened to all of the engineering things. I've read all of it, most of it's over my head. Um, so I'm here to speak from my heart as a resident of the area. And I think you people are getting a little lost in all the legalities and all of the, this report, this report, that report. And you're forgetting about the people who live up there. We are a caring group. We've been here for months and months and months now in front of you. Um, if we're not hearing as much in number each time, we're getting tired too. But we stand firm in our belief that this is wrong. This is not what Niskina should stand for. This is not what you should be doing. The amount of signs that have increased should give you a visual picture. Uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. I could sit up here and give you a thousand words. Drive around. They're, they're growing in number. There's a number of people that aren't Ruffner Road residents who have signs up who are telling you this is not what the residents in Niskiuna want for their town. I think you're opening up a can of worms if you let a, res a, a development like this go forth. What's to happen with the next empty lots? We've got a couple on Rosendale Road. What's going to happen there? Is the next group going to come and say, well, you allowed townhouses there. Can you stop us? I don't think Niskiuna people want to be a town of townhouses. I think we are proud of the fact that we have well-maintained, beautiful homes that we care for. We're only asking that you people care the same way. If you lived up on Ruffner and it was your backyard being impacted, I'd like to hope you would think with your heart because that's how I'm addressing you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Charles Horowitz. I live at 1223 Rough in the Road. I um, uh, just want to follow up on some comments that I have made uh, at the last meeting. Uh, I reviewed uh, the packet that went out 
and I'm referring to the planning board findings of May 8th, uh, page 8 of 10. Uh, and this is where you discuss the sharp bend in the road as it exits Ruffner Road, Paper Street, in essence, creating three front yards for the 1219 Ruffner Road property, which is potentially an unforeseen hardship. Uh, I spoke about this item last meeting. Uh, first, I would like to say it is not potentially an unforeseen hardship. It is an unforeseen hardship. But in addition, I talked about the hardship to my own property next door, where I would be having a public road installed right on my backyard, where that has not been the case at all in this neighborhood, ever. I expected that in making those comments that it would find its way into your record, not just be a part of the privilege of the floor. And so I began to wonder, how do my comments, how does the impact to me personally get included in the record? All of the assessments that, that you have had record to uh, and most of the discussion has been to the general neighborhood and to Niski unit in general, but not to the individual people who border on this, uh, on this project. And I think that that's leaving out a very crucial and important part. Each of us shares the neighborhood and the larger problems that, that this uh, project presents, but we also have individual uh, situations which should be included in the record not just be limited to the privilege on, uh, on the floor. Now, uh, one of the things that I came across in the engineer and surveyor's report dated May 5th, uh, they were discussing in section C, the average density development, and they stated that the uh, developer's response was the architectural style of the proposed units will be compatible with the general character of the neighborhood to the extent possible. However, they may be modern style homes and generally not visible from Ruffner Road. Well, that's not true. They will be visible from my backyard. If you were to put a map up of this project, you would see that the house that is being proposed is closest to my property and my house than any other. I have a differential impact than other people. And to say it's not visible, who checks that? Who, who fact checks that? That is not accurate. But if I, was, if I was to be questioned and I could point that out and it was to become part of the record, that is something that should go through. It shouldn't just be me talking in this forum. It should be part of the official record. Now, when I looked at the last map, because every single, every single meeting I have to come back and, and look at a map and go through 200 pages to find something new. Now I see there is a 15 foot high golf ball netting, okay? So this is, this is the new thing that is being thrown at my property. Myself and my neighbor at 1219 are the people who are most affected by this, but this is brushed over and that is a major thing. Who wants, who, who wants a driving range netting in their backyard? after 34 years of living here. I don't. What I am suggesting is that a part of the assessment should not just be all of these official water flows and environmental and conservation, but it should be a part of your assessment that somebody interviews all of the people who are bordering on this project to say, how is this project specifically affecting you personally as well? you, your property, your way of life, and your property values. Otherwise, you're not getting the full picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Laura and members of the planning board. <clears throat> My name is Mike Mason and I reside at 2144 Mountain View Avenue. Before I moved here, I lived in a two-family house on Waverly Place in Schenectady. The area was zoned 
for single family dwellings. <clears throat> but our house and a few other multi families were grandfathered. Traffic was heavy at times, and some multi family units were not owner occupied. But during the entire period that I owned the building, there were no applications for zoning variants. We all trusted that zoning ordinances were enforced. Now, I thought in finding a home to meet the needs of a growing family, I looked for a larger home and a large lot in a residential neighborhood. Rock and Road fit the bill. And with zoning that would protect and support my family. Since moving, <clears throat> I've landscaped, installed furnace, put in a driveway, replaced roofs, windows, and doors inside and out, fireproofed the garage, and did everything I could to bring it up to the existing code, even though it was an older house. Then the list goes on. Meanwhile, I paid taxes that have increased on a regular basis as the value of my house has increased. Since I still have faith that zoning ordinances are enforced, I don't understand why someone with a total disregard for existing zoning intended to protect neighborhoods would ever consider requesting a building permit with 67 variances. This developer has demonstrated total disregard for the integrity and zoning of an established neighborhood made of people just like me who rely on zoning to protect their family's property and quality of life. This process has necessitated a burdensome amount of time and inconvenience for me, my neighbors, the planning board, and town officials. No one has this kind of time to waste. We thank you for your time and support. And I had one comment on that road that goes along the side of 1219 Rucker Road and then takes a sharp turn and goes behind, oh, at least a half a dozen houses. Those people front on Ruckner Road. Now they back on this other road, which people use to drive around and come in front of their houses. So they drive on both sides of those houses. And that's contrary to the most of Niskayuna. I thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Louisa Lombardo, 1242 Ruffner. I've spoken many times, and I guess tonight I want to, when the representative from Kelts Farm was here, he had positive things to say and then also some concerns to say. But then he said, yeah, you know, people want to build and live, you know, on a golf course. What could be nicer? And I just have to laugh because it's not bucolic the way he's thinking. I live on the other side. I live on the even side. And at the crack of dawn, if not before, you can hear the buzz, you know, the buzzing of the leaf blowers, the, the lawnmower crew for hours, hours. And I'm thinking, you know, now you're going to cut down the trees. So all that noise will just continue to pass through. You know, when they have a wedding or a party, you hear the music. OK, Fourth of July, you can hear the fireworks. But again, it's like every morning, the buzz, buzz, buzz of the blowers and, and the lawnmowers. One of the comments when they were building these houses, one of the features that they talked about was that they'll all have oversized garages to accommodate the golf court carts. How are those golf carts gonna access the golf course? Are they gonna come out, rough in the road, swing around, go? I, how are they gonna go through everybody's backyard? And, and this subdivision isn't even part of the country club. So it's like they want their cake and eat it too. We're not really part of the country club or the golf course, but they're going to have full access to it. So there's just many, so many different ideas that just aren't fitting together. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, I'm Josh Spain. My three boys and I live at 1219 Ruffner Road. Um, I think as you would expect, I'm here, as I had before, to state my opposition to the development of 14 acres, as well as any access along Ruffner Road. Um, I think we have here this resolution 2023-15. And just as important, the accompanying planning board report to the, to the town board. Um, the case is clearly made in these documents why the special use permit should be rejected. And I also feel like it presents a strong and convincing case why there should be no development of those 14 acres along Ruffner Road in any way. Um, so tonight I'm really just here to urge you, urge the planning board as a whole to do the right thing and vote in favor of the resolution. Recommend that the town board reject the special use permit request. Uh, not only, you know, voting in favor sends a clear message to the Mohawk Club, frankly, that there are numerous issues and concerns. And as Sushana mentioned before, whether it's engineering, whether it's environmental, whether it's safety, whether it's you know pure character of the neighborhood. It's not just one specific thing, there's so many there. And I think they're, they're very clearly delineated and you really need to keep that in mind. I think vote in favor of the resolution is the right thing to do. Uh, if and when the Mohawk Club brings forward a revised proposal, I don't think any of us are naive. We know that if for some reason this permit doesn't go through, there are other options for them. Some may require an SUP, some may not. I, Continue to come back to this resolution and the accompanying report. Keep those handy because I think it's going to inform and guide any future decisions regarding that development and why it shouldn't happen at all. So thanks very much. Thank you. My name is Jim Dillon, and I live at 1242 Ruffner Road. And I want to speak about where the proposed access road is on Ruffner Road and the impact of it on the character of our neighborhood. Because of that, I've deliberately stopped at that spot when I go for a walk or when I drive a car. And I take some time and I look at the trees, and I look at the greenery. I, I wonder if the uh, developers in their plan ever took the time, 10 minutes, to stop and look at those trees and look at the greenery. I think it'd be worth 10 minutes. Because when you cut a tree down, it, it's cut down forever. And trees are very important for many, many reasons. And if you were to sit across in that spot and look at those trees and really look at them and look at that greenery, I think it'd be impossible for you to say that putting a road in there would have minimal effect on the character of our neighborhood and the ecology. And the idea of them coming in and cutting down those trees to put in a road is really reprehensible. And I just urge everyone to take the time. Remember, 10 minutes is not a long time compared to forever if those trees are cut down. So sit across those trees and look at them and say, is it worth it? And I think if you care about the environment and you care about the neighborhood, I don't see how you could say that it is worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Deborah Friedson. I live at 2508 Waymer Lane. Despite being a teacher, public speaking is one of my worst <laughs> and most dreaded things that I do. The fact that I'm standing here for like the third or fourth time is a testament to how much I support my neighbors and believe that this project needs to be voted down. Um, I've lived on my street for about 35 years. We are now grandparents in the neighborhood. We were at one time young homeowners and uh, invested in our neighborhood and our home um, and have loved this neighborhood. I've told you before how much I adore Waymer Lane as well as Ruffner Road, which I walk on daily, which I drive on daily. And I'm appalled, as I've told you before, at the scope of this project. It's so inappropriate. The destruction I've seen already in preparation for this project 
people can tell me, no, they're not preparing for this. I don't believe it. I know what I see when I walk by some of the homes of the people I've spoken before me. The destruction of the environment is occurring already, and it is really sad. It's very sad. So I want to ask you, I am the heart of the organizations that I work for. I'm known as the person who's the conscience. I'm the peacemaker. I have such respect for the fact that you have sat here and listened with such politeness and your demeanor I've appreciated. However, when I hear or see in the notes that I haven't heard anything new, I'd like to instead see I have heard you. I have heard each one of you. I hope that you've heard each one of us. This is an emotional issue for me because I'm watching the environment as I'm raising my granddaughter, babysitting her two days a week, and I think this is just not right. So what I'm saying to you as a friend to my neighbors and as a um, taxpayer in Niskuna, as a former teacher, as someone who believes in our town, please, I beg you, do the right thing. Vote no. This is not appropriate for our neighborhood. I was just down in the villages and I was thinking, oh my God, this is what it's gonna be in my neighborhood. No, this doesn't belong here. Go to Florida, go someplace else. There's other options. It doesn't belong here. This is wrong. Please do the right thing. And I thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you. Anybody else? We have anybody online tonight, Laura? <clears throat> yeah, so I um I have Juliana Postgood. I didn't know if you wanted to speak or you're just listening. Thank you for asking. I reside at 1169 Highland Park Road, and I am in opposition to the development of the Mohawk Golf Club. Okay, thank you. And then I also have Benjamin and Melanie Romer. Hey, thank you. Um, my husband and I live at 1250 Ruffner Road. Um, we have spoken before. We have submitted letters in opposition to this development. And, um, you know, I, I too see things that are happening at the golf course already and trees already being taken down in other areas and affecting other homes around the outskirts of the golf club. And it, it really does sadden me to see that already happening. And the idea that this potentially could go through is, is truly heartbreaking for living where we do. Um, walking up and down Ruffner Road is something that I absolutely love to do with my now one-year-old. And, um, you know, I just really hope that you take into consideration our lives and um, what we've already been going through with this, our time and your time as well. Um, so my husband and I both are voting in opposition and we hope you do the same. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all I have on That's it. Can yeah. I make a last call for anybody here for privilege of the floor then? Last call. Any planning and zoning matters? Okay, seeing or hearing no one, we'll close privilege of the floor, thank you. And we'll move on to unfinished business. <clears throat> the only unfinished, unfinished business item we have tonight, of course, is a resolution 2023-15. That's a resolution to make a recommendation to town board on a special use permit for a 22 lot average density development subdivision con consisting of 10 single family detached homes and 12 town homes at 1851 Union Street off of Ruffner Road. All right, and the uh, resolution has been posted. I'm just gonna summarize uh, the end. Further resolved, this planning board and zoning commission hereby recommends that the town board reject the special use permit for a 22 lot average density development subdivision consisting of 10 single family detached homes and 12 town homes at 1851 Union Street off of Ruffner Road as shown in the above reference drawings. The findings for this recommendation by a planning board are attached to this resolution. Can I have a motion on the resolution? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, moved by Mr. Diarpino for approval. Do I have a second? Seconded. And second by Mr. Kahn. Uh, what I'd like to do next is uh, have discussion. And uh, what we're going to do is have the applicant come forward uh, to give us an update before we get into our deliberations on the findings. So it's uh, the only opportunity for the applicant to um, uh, bring us up to date on uh, where engineering stands and things have changed since the last meeting. And if they want to make any comments regarding your fi findings, now is the appropriate time. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill Sweet, representing Mohawk Golf Club. Uh, as you are all aware, we did have our TDE meeting, and um, the meeting minutes reflect that there were six items that needed to be addressed immediately. There were a number of other items that would be addressed as you move through site plan approval process. But in the short term, we've realigned the entrance road near the 11th green, so it's straight and in the center of the right-of-way, as Laura had requested and Highway Department had requested. We show the appropriate landscaping now and fencing between the 11th green and the roadway for protection of the uh, roadway use and golf balls that potentially could hit that. The thought there is that we do a staggered row of arborvitae or something that would fill in and then embed a nylon screening in between the trees so it would not be visible. Uh, it would be shielded by the trees that would be on both sides of it. Um, we've also taken the um, required Niski Unilateral ladder truck turning radiuses and have applied those to the emergency access. We've noted that the emergency access path will be maintained and plowed by Mohawk Golf Club, so it will not be a town liability or obligation. Instead of individual grinder pumps, the recommendation was made that we put in uh, gravi gravity sewer to a single pump station that would pump up then to Ruckner Road to the northern end of the sewer district, which we've agreed to. We also provided a color aerial exhibit showing the stormwater area and how it relates to holes 11, 12, and 13. And it really does become integrated into the golf course landscape uh, by virtue of its location. And that being said, that's all I have to report on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll open it to the board for any discussion before we uh, go through the findings or, or we just go through the findings, I guess. We can have a discussion during that. So why don't we just go ahead and do that. So we're gonna go through the findings and see if there's any comments as we move through those. And then after we go through the findings, we'll uh, take our vote, okay? Mr. Diopino. Um, so the first item up is review of section 220-20 average density development. Uh, purpose of this section is the permit variation in lot size and housing type is suitable in areas in order to encourage flexibility to design and facilitate adequate economical provisions of streets and utilities. Uh, the planning board finds that this particular configuration of an ADD proposal does not balance the economic provisions of streets and utilities, preservation of natural and scenic qualities and open space. Uh, the street patterns for a single family home subdivision and average density development are nearly identical, but the reduction of the size fragments rather than providing any significant protection of natural and scenic open space. One of the revisions that did occur post TDE meeting with the town and the applicant was the change to the proposed gravity pump station um, that will need some annual maintenance and a driveway paved and supported by the town's large vac truck. Um, also, the last part of the finding was the Architectural Review Board uh, reviewed it and said that the existing plan neither capitalizes on the potential for beautiful views of the golf course, nor does it blend in well with the neighboring homes. And I do take exception to those findings. Okay. Um, going back to when the ADD was being developed, this actually was one of the areas that was considered because we wanted to protect a lot of the land without taking the land from the owners. Uh, the fundamental part of this that has not been mentioned is that property owners are entitled to reasonable use of their land. So my analysis starts from, is this a reasonable use? They want to take I believe we established it's less than 7% of their land and put in a residential neighborhood similar to what's already there and for which it's already zoned. The average density development conserves land. It puts in less infrastructure. It's a greener option all the way around. Uh, so to me, it's reasonable and appropriate use of the land. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gold. We'll just go through those and if anybody has any comments. I don't think, uh, unless uh, somebody makes a motion to change that, 
and then you get a second, I think we'll just leave, you know, we'll leave the findings as they were written, written, and obviously we'll vote at the end. I may be out on my own, I understand that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gold. But I'm, I'm an analyst by nature, education, training, and profession, <clears throat> so I analyze very carefully. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Okay. Um Item B, under the same subsect, uh, conditions for lot size reduction. Purposes <clears throat> are achieved by permitting lot size <clears throat> excuse me, to be reduced in subdivision tract if, number one, the overall density does not exceed that which is permitted. Um, this current application has provided an R1 subdivision sketch showing both 22 single-family homes and proposed 22 lot average density development. And item two is the land thus gained is preserved as permanent open space for the use of the residents of the area. The forest proposed as a buffer to the adjacent residents has benefit limited to the direct adjacent parcels but little benefit to the surrounding neighborhood. Large triangle of open space would not be used, um, be to any use basically of the of the residents in the area. Okay, I just, again, if somebody has a comment, just go ahead and speak up, okay? Again, the idea is to preserve land. This does accomplish that. Okay. I just wanted to add one comment and you know, it addresses part of Mrs. Ms. Gold's comments. Um, and we've seen a few average density developments in the town. And they'll come a little bit later in the language. Everything about the open space on this average, develop, average density development application seeks really to actually buffer it from the surrounding and the negative impacts that it would have on the surrounding as the average density development. And I think that's a fundamental flaw in this application. It's not mm -hmm. parkland, and I know that the applicant is gonna do parkland by a fee. It's not accessible land to the <clears throat> residents. It's just, you know, we can compare to the most recent one that we did. That's a place where everyone can go and walk about, enjoy the open space, et cetera, et cetera. Heck, to the point that the adjacent neighbors didn't even want cars driving through there. So I think that the fundamental definition of the ADD relative to the open space is just grossly flawed in, in the way this is laid out. <clears throat> well, I think that the, um, the, um, the open space being used as a buffer, in my view, is a, is a positive thing here because we want as much buffer between the, the backs of the residents along Ruffer Road and the proposed development. Um, I think if you look at the history of other average density developments, you'll see similar situations. And I think you'll see similar, similar situations where there is not a public use of the land, that the land is basically um, just open space and not used by the uh, uh, residents of the town. And I don't recall there being a requirement that it be open to the public. It, it, well, that's not, it's not a requirement. <coughs> I think it's the requirement is that you have open space. Uh, it obviously be great to, to have it be used, but to also with open space, if you have a, like an R1 residential development, that not, doesn't necessarily have to be a pocket park or, uh, so I'm agreeing with you, Ms. Gold. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times, you know, payment in lieu of uh, of parkland is utilized to support uh, the parks, but not at that particular location. And that's what this uh, applicant is proposing. I'm not saying we need to change this, but I just want to, you know, make that point that the you know, the buffer in this case is is what we're looking for. We're looking for as much as a buffer as possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, after requirements for an average density development, in addition to the criteria reviewed, established in Article Eight of this chapter, the Planning Board shall apply the following standards to their site plan review um, <clears throat> for these types of projects. Number one, where permitted, the section applies to only lands in RR and R1. This parcel in question is located in R1 zone. So it's appropriate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, B, lot size variation. You can just summarize, Dave. Basically, <laughs> lot size has got to be greater than 10 acres, right. and, and this application is for 14, so it meets the, the requirement. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Okay. Um, uh, land associated with structure which is attached single family dwelling units or located should be considered lot <clears throat> for the purposes of applying standards for yard dimensions. Uh, the yard dimensions are shown attached for single family dwellings. Uh, number three, lots detached single family dwellings and those portions of land on which attached single family dwelling units are located shall be used when determining 
the reduced lot size to be set aside for open space, and the, the yard dimensions are shown again on the attached application. <clears throat> Number three, the dwelling units. So this one here refers to chapter 189 in the subdivision of land. So uh, to summarize this paragraph, um, basically the zoning ordinance is um, in the district, a district which such lands are situated, conforming to the other applicable requirements. Considerations of terrain, topography, drainage, and flooding potential are some of the major items. Uh, the findings revealed that the planning board reviewed a 22 single lot family home subdivision sketch. The sketch did not show drainage, flooding potential, or account for possible proposed parkland requirements. Okay. <clears throat> um, B, the dwelling unit types, a minimum of 40% of the total numbers of the project dwelling units shall be single family detached units with remaining units being townhomes or semi-detached. 10 single family homes and 10 and 12 townhomes equates to 45% of the units being single family homes. Uh, number being detached, they're all intended to be single family homes. <clears throat> so your summation is that a townhome is a single family? Yes. I believe there have been four cases that attest to that. That's why we actually break it down like that. Right. But it's detached and attached. <clears throat> But they are meant to be single family dwellings. Yeah, but this one is just distinguishing the number of single family. Yeah, it meets the minimum requirement yeah. for the distribution of single family right. versus townhouses, all but that stuff. It's allowed. Yeah, it's allowed, exactly, under an approved average density development. They're not apartments. Yep. They're meant to be used as single family homes. And that's what, yep. And that's what it says. Okay. Just, just trying to clarify that point. Yep. <clears throat> Number four, open space requirements, uh, quantitative considerations. Subdividers shall set aside for an open space purposes the same percentage of entire proposed development that which the total lot area have been reduced. Uh, <clears throat> the findings are the total area of lot reduction is 67,206 um, square feet, and the total area of proposed open space is 118,678,000 um, square feet. Um, land reserved for uh, judgment of the planning board and locations and size and shapes of the lot character size suitable for purposes. Uh, such land should be primarily used. Types may include playgrounds, neighborhood parks, natural conservation areas, natural water course. Um, portion of the submittal to the planning board, the subdivider shall propose conditions to establish continuing ownership and maintenance of the open space land. The planning board may require that the open space be located at a suitable place on the edge of the subdivision so the land may be added at a uh, later time. The open space subdivision, subdivision consists of natural area forest that is 2.72 acres total, at least one acre of a 50 foot wide linear strip land that backs up to the proposed homes. Uh, the planning board finds that the size and shape does not take advantage of the open space scenic qualities of the golf course and is not accessible to the public and is not an optimal national or natural conservation area for wildlife. Again, there's no requirement that it be open to the public. Yeah. And the whole issue of the views of the golf course, I don't think that's in our town code at all. That might be the very subjective view of the architectural review board, but it's not necessarily the view of potential residents or anybody else. I've known a lot of people over the years who did live adjacent to golf courses, as in basically on them. And they weren't all happy with that. They wish they were a little bit separated. Seems a poorly named golf ball can go just as far in the wrong direction as it can in the right direction. People want some buffering. <coughs> The comments on the comments on buffering, and the comments um, about lot sizes, although they weren't reviewed in detail, they do go when compared to the character of the neighborhood, and I think aspects of view and aspects of um, just that, again, that buffering that exists for the purpose of the ADD only, right, shielding the ADD from the rest of the neighborhood, 
right? Definitely goes to character of the neighborhood, which is a part of the code and it is a part of the requirement we need to convey. Um, so I'm confused. So are you saying that the, um, the all those add to the character, but these questions aren't about character yet, these findings? The findings are referring specifically to the qualitative considerations that are listed. For listed. Uh, natural or conservation area, right. water course, and it says the planning board may require that the open space be located. So I just want to make sure that's clear. It may require. Yep. And my, my view, again, is that I would love, love as much uh, buffering between the uh, backs of the current residents and, and any development, if it does happen there, as much as possible. So I think, uh, in this case, the average density development gives the best opportunity because that's, you know, included in the average density de development. But um, I'm okay with the as written. Okay. The next two items <clears throat> refer to the homeowners association charters. Um, in the event that default by the association, the town can take over the continuing ownership and maintenance of all the open space and land, and tax land land owners accordingly. Uh, there is no homeowners association associated with this proposal. The land is proposed to be deed restricted and remain ownership of the golf course. Okay, the next item is also homeowners association charters, an obligation on the part of all homeowners in the development to adhere to maintenance and appearance standards um, established, which are acceptable to the town. Again, this, there is no homeowners association with this proposal. The land is proposed to be deed restricted, same as, same as the above. Okay. <clears throat> Minimum width, the reserved open space shall not be narrower than 200 feet, except where necessary to provide a pathway or other means of access. An easement for natural water course dedicated to the town may be considered as open space for the purpose of this regulation if such an easement is at least 200 feet wide. Open space shall be arranged to provide an area of adequate size and shape um, so as to be the value to the residents. So currently the open space at its narrowest is 50 feet. The strip of 50 feet extends approximately 1,000 feet, totaling 50,000 square feet of the proposed open space. The remaining area is forested triangle, approximately 68,000 square feet, um, with a maximum width of the triangle is 200 feet. <clears throat> so the, uh, the land is also difficult for the developer to develop and is not accessible to the surrounding residents. And the open space does not take advantage of the open or scenic qualities, again, of the golf course, which was stated previously, such for hab uh, habitat of wildlife, it's fragmented and mostly linear. Um, two acres of Fragmented habitat does not support wildlife in the same manner as a large consolidated acreage reserve. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next item H, considerations in the report, the additions to the considerations set forth in chapters 220.59 and 220.46b of the planning board should also determine that if such development is not detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of the persons residing in the vicinity or injurious to the purposes and property of improvements within its proximity. So the proposal includes opening up a new intersection on a road that conducts a fair amount of traffic within the neighborhoods of Ruffner Road. The planning board explored alternative access points and indicated the preference for the pre-existing right of way. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> number two, the proposed development is in conformity with the objectives of the comprehensive plan, especially the proposal relates to the implementation of highways, parks, preservation of scenic and open space. So these next five paragraphs, or actually six paragraphs, are, are direct snippets that were taken from the 2013 comprehensive plan. Um, I'll quickly summarize them. They were, um, first one talks about livability factors such as parks and open spaces. Um, it encourages that as Nisikuna reaches full build out to carefully um, review each of these projects and not to, you know, basically succumb to developmental pressures, but to look at each project um, as an individual one to see if it's a benefit to the, to the community. Um, the Mohawk Golf Club is specifically mentioned in the next one as an important parcel within the town. It also is one of the largest privately owned parcels and um, does relate to uh, several several houses and other uh, commercial businesses in the area. Um, open space is a non-renewable resource. And as the, again, the town reaches full build out um, and development pressures intensify, uh, each one of these things needs to be looked at. 
uh, the, the larger portion of the Mohawk Golf Club parcel and its 14 acre piece should be uh, looked at for considerable planning uh, purposes. The plan examines and reissues related to residential development and as residential areas throughout the town, one of the greatest assets it should be protected from inappropriate and poor design and does not contribute to the overall intent of a neighborhood. Uh, the planning board finds that by maximizing the lots and fragmenting the open space, uh, the design of average density development does not really contribute and meet what the in design intent is. Um, the issue area of land use also identified in the plan. Um, basically, as the town continues to grow, existing large land parcels may be identified for development, resulting in drastic shifts from their current use. Um, again, that relates to infrastructure, um, preservation of open space, and also it um, does not want to uh, promote <clears throat> piecemeal um, subdivision. And then while the planning board recognizes the right of the developer to pursue subdivision application, a poorly planned average density development application that is not harmonious with the surrounding residential neighborhoods does not capitalize on open space opportunities and potentially shifts the land pattern from open space recreation to clustered home development, which is contrary to the town's comprehensive plan. However, we did put the average density development option in our code in a, and I think that balances this out. They're not getting more units, they're getting the same number they would otherwise. I don't think it's poorly planned. I think it was a better plan, as much as I hate to say it, when they were gonna remove the one house and put the road in with two shorter spans of road rather than the one coming off from the road, the paper street. But we've got other places where we've gone much more than the 500 feet on a cul-de-sac or dead end. And I, I don't think this is a poor plan. Totally unpopular with the residents nearby, I understand, but that doesn't make it a poor plan. Um, looking at the comprehensive plan, it also talks about traffic and safety as well. Um, there's several sections around page 30, 31, 35 uh, that talk about uh, looking into continual issues with traffic volume or safety concerns. And there's already some at Ruffner Road. You know, does this uh, does this add to those safety concerns? There's goal implementation tasks in our comprehensive plan that talk about interconnection between isolated subdivisions and cul-de-sacs. And is this, you know, going against our comprehensive plan to <clears throat> make things a little more interconnected. So I think those are other things in the comprehensive plan that should be considered. Mm. The only concern with that, you could apply that to any development anywhere. So we would have no, no development, which is the right, as Ms. Gold said, of the applicant. Um, if you look at the traffic study, it's been done. If my understanding is that it wasn't conservative enough, enough when it gets redone, it'll actually show that there's very uh, um, small traffic impact as a result of this uh, uh, 22 lot subdivision. While the traffic study that was done on our request at this point in the application process, I view as being adequate. As we've done in other neighborhoods, this neighborhood does warrant a live, longer duration traffic study to truly assess what the traffic pressures are beyond just morning and afternoon pit trips. Yep. But that would be later in a process, yep. right. not at this point. So. Yeah, if that's a current concern, that can be addressed. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, and just to encapsulate those kind of five, six paragraphs from the comprehensive plan, um, they also echo, I think, what the Conservation Advisory Council really had a lot of concerns with, is that this is one large parcel of land right now, and um, if it were to be developed without good planning, if this is the subdivision that sets the tone for the remainder of the parcel, um, you know, does that make a lot of sense? That's what that development shift really means. So right now you have the larger parcels and like this proposal would potentially shift the development in the area 
um, in a whole different way without, and in a piecemeal way, which is problematic, I think, um, without really understanding the whole parcel and, and taking into account the development pressures in and around it. Um, so I think those last two parcels, um, those last two pieces, the piecemeal consideration of the subdivision and open space, so like piecemeal consideration of the open space and also potentially shifting the land use patterns really need to be highlighted out of the conference plan. Well, we got 200 acres of open space. Obviously, I don't want to see it all get developed and I don't. nobody else really wants to. But again, it's a, a zoned R1, so the new comprehensive plan committee, you know, if they're looking to do something, it needs to happen instead of just being talked because we have a potential large R1 development in our future if the golf course were to fail. And I've got a couple of points on this as well. One, the applicant has stated repeatedly that they don't plan on developing, they want to keep the golf course. However, we know it's still a possibility at some point, but that would be a very different scenario regardless of this project because the golf course has access onto Troy's Connected View Road. The curb cuts are already there. We don't have to beg, cajole, and probably nonetheless lose a request to state DOT to put a curb cut in. It's there. We've actually got at least two. That's oh, Union Street, right? So any development of the whole parcel <coughs> that would follow this would start with those access points. And I suspect we might be looking at one way in and one way out. I don't know that, but it would kind of make sense. But it would be a very different project, regardless of whether this one exists or not. So, Ms. Gold, first of all, I really appreciate the, the um, perspective that this board gives individually to this. This is a, a very difficult decision, but I was struggling. I, I was struggling. Really? That's rare. Okay. As a drummer, usually you can hear me. Um, what I'm struggling with is what Mr. Darpino indicated with the comprehensive plan as this city becomes more developed or town becomes more developed and we approach that build out status. You know, no one can argue that um, we have plenty of open spaces. We could build out a heck of a lot more if we wanted to. However, our code changes slightly, um, but what does change is the perception and the actual available land. And we are hitting that point being here for 10 years that we really need to look at these decisions differently as we move forward. So the exceptions that we make have to really be looked at at this moment in time. Your point, Mrs. Gold, about the access roads, if it were another project down the road, redevelopment of that R1, that they would look at the access on Union Street, but they didn't on this, right? So I can't trust that that would be the case. I just think you're right. And that's why this is a piecemeal, one-off, doesn't quite fit, shape isn't quite normal, it, all the things that were mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to comment on that because I was thinking the same thing. It's all set up for R1. It could be a great development on its own. That's not what this is. But that's not their goal. And frankly, the town, from everything I've heard for all these years, is the town would like to see it stay a golf course because it would have a major traffic impact if it were fully developed as residential. Yeah. They don't want to do that. This doesn't get them there in any manner, shape, or form. It allows them to take less than 7% of their land and put in a small residential area. I think it's a reasonable use of the land. And that's what the law requires. Well, they don't want to do that now. That's what they're saying now. So in 10 years from now, when they come back and they're going to say, well, we want to look at all these other access points that they wouldn't consider this time around, you can't guarantee what they're going to come back with. You know, you can say, and it was put to me as I understood it, that the golf club would continue in perpetuity despite this development coming in. I'm not sure, actually, I take a lot of credence in that. But nonetheless, um, you don't know what they're going to do. You don't know what, you, what they're going to do. I think, it's, I think it behooves us to look holistically at everything to see what could come in. What are the things they could come back with? Because I would not write it off as that being a very real possibility. We had scarce with the golf club 
not being sustained over the years. This is at least the third time I've been aware of it. And they found somebody who bailed them out. They are trying very hard to keep it afloat. It's now down to one owner. And I've never met the man. Don't know anything about him. All I can go by is what they keep telling us. And the fact that it is functioning. And I don't think we can attribute ulterior motives legally to an applicant. No, of course not. That seems to be what not. you're trying to do. No, of course not. I'm just saying yeah. that you can't put parameters on this uh, developer not to come back and say, well, you know, you said yeah. years ago that you weren't going to do anything. Well, we are doing something. If you're actually going to put, you, I don't, can't even see that there could be any kind of covenant put in that to, to make that you're not going to develop it again. And if truly, if this development is not is not contingent on the on the golf club continuing, this shouldn't be that big of a deal for them financially. I don't know how much of a big deal it is financially. Just to it's not the issue. They're entitled to reasonable use of the land. Putting residential development on land that's already zoned for it using a tool that we very deliberately added to our code many years ago now. Because I remember it goes back to when we had our first player, Diane Sturman. That goes back in time. And the goal was to try to get in reasonable properties for single family and keep more of the space open and green, have less infrastructure, which at some point, you know, when you're talking roads and sewers and water lines at some point it becomes a town's responsibility and the less of that you have the less green space is disturbed the easier it is for the town to try to maintain it all and i think this project meets those goals just to um just to reiterate and bring us back to move us away from hypotheticals of the future and bring us back to the section we're addressing here. My apologies. No, 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 I, I, <laughs> it, it's a comment for me and for everyone else. The This section specifically, res, we respond to it in the findings by way of the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan looks at the Mohawk Golf, Mohawk Golf Club as an entire entity. It's clear in the plan. The points Laura made about piecemeal development is something that we have to be very conscious of and I think all of us as planning board members will agree to that. And by definition, X percent of a entity that the comprehensive plan looks at as being an entire entity, by definition, it's a piecemeal development. It doesn't matter what the future holds relative to owners, use, anything else. Um, when I look at the Mohawk Golf Club in the context of the comprehensive plan, it's an R1 district. And this would be an ADD that gets abutted in between two R1 districts on a huge entity that's viewed as a single entity in the comp plan. But a property owner has a right to subdivide <clears throat> unless there are some extreme circumstances that would block it. Yep. And they're using it for the zone. They want to apply the zoning requirements in the ADD. I keep coming back to that because that's the law. They're not proposing something that we don't already allow. Right, and, and Leslie, you're absolutely correct on that, and that's why we're here, but mm -hmm. the code and the legality of the code does support the discussion that we're having, right? That's why we're actually having the discussion, okay. and we're making the arguments simply as a recommendation to the legal deciding body, the town board, from a planning perspective, from a comp plan perspective, from an engineering perspective, what the merits of this specific application is. Not we're, not judging, we're not judging the ADD, right? Because we've actually enacted the ADD in our code. We're judging this application. I thought by now you might know me well enough to know I actually enjoy debates. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I look at things in a very hard analytical way. We need to remember that this is written uh, to support that the town board deny. So, you know, there obviously are some of the items that you, uh, you could have a viewpoint either way for all the board members, right? Um, but the way it's written, it's written to deny. So, 
know, Ms. Gold, uh, you know, her, her comments, you know, are valid, um, whether or not this changes. You know, it's just something that the town board will have their own opinion. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right, the next item is focused on chapter 189 of the subdivision of land. Um, a is the character of the land to be subdivided shall be of such character that it can be used safely for building purposes without danger, health, or peril from fire, flood, or other menace. Uh, the planning board has open questions about the length of the cul-de-sac and the interaction of the proposed public roadway with the golf course uh, use and operations. And those open questions are, are fine because, again, we're in the early stages <clears throat> And no matter what type of right. development, if there was any other development, we'd still have the same concerns and questions that we need to address. And they've already partially responded on that point. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. There were some updates made from the, mm -hmm. um, the TDE meeting. Okay, uh, B is a conformity to the official map and master plan. Subdivision shall, shall conform to the official map of the town and be in harmony with the master plan. Um, as previously documented, findings for the ADD um, reference to code 220-28 H2, uh, the planning board finds that this proposal is not in conformity with the town master plan. The town's official map does not show a layout of roads through this parcel. Yeah, my only comment there, I have a little bit of trouble with this one, is that, you know, my question myself, I say, well, why would it, you know? It's a, a golf course and it's been a golf course. So, you know, when developing the comprehensive plan or the town map, I mean, I wouldn't go putting roads in there and saying, let's develop this and put roads in. Uh, the access easement is shown on the official town map. Right, there's a dotted line that shows the access easement. and uh, I, I would have to pull the map to see if the access easement is shown yeah. on the town official map. Yeah, I took a look at it. I'm yeah. not sure about that, but just to clarify, <coughs> oh, okay. there, I got are, it with me. there are areas on the town official map that are undeveloped or were undeveloped when the town's official map was enacted. It, it really hasn't been updated since the late 90s. Actually. Correct. But... Um, like for instance, like up between Balltown Road and um, Aqueduct, the town official map showed connections there that weren't platted or subdivided, but in the official map, it, comp it contemplated future connections through that parcel. There's a couple of them there. Um, there was one that just went to the zoning board. There's a couple in uh, Rose, uh, Rose Hill subdivision kind of area. There are even were some actually that uh, crisscrossed through wetlands down between like console road. And um, so there definitely are areas on the official map that contemplated roads through undeveloped parcels. I just wanted to make that. Yep, and I just wanna make clear, okay. if you take a look, I think you'll see the access easement as a dotted line, at least a short stub on the official town map. And none of that negates the ability of the town to add roads. When a large parcel that's vacant is developed, it's pretty much the norm for a road to be added, sometimes more roads. Yeah. We're putting a lot of pressure on the new comp comprehensive plan committee. These are things that <laughs> obviously need to be addressed. You, and You can't yeah. contemplate what people are going to build. Well, it's just a fact that the roads are going to be Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, See the specifications for required improvements are requirements all constructed to be installed to conform to the town specifications, um, which can be obtained from the town engineer. This is a revision from the previous one based on the TDE's comment. So engineering studies are required for all proposed water, sewer, and stormwater improvements. Uh, the location of the pump station may require a larger parcel for maintenance. The road to the pump station will have to be paved and the width of the pavement turnaround will need to be accommodate the town's large back truck and the town discourages long driveways to pump station because of maintenance and plowing uh, specifically in the winter months. Uh, next item uh, refers to the stormwater pollution prevention plan, also referred to as SWIPS. It will be submitted as part of the preliminary subdivision. An application is outlined in chapter 180 of the town code in Iskiuna. Um, a SWIP would be required should the project progress to preliminary subdivision review. Okay, uh, moving on to street layout, uh, width and location of construction. Streets shall be sufficient in width, suitably located and adequate construction to conform to the master plan and accommodate proposed traffic and, and affordable access for firefighting, snow removal and other road maintenance equipment. This again was one of the items based on the TDE that was uh, revised and also refers to now that has raised concerns of the length of the cul-de-sac and the usability of the emergency access proposed 
between two single family residences on Ruffner Road. The applicant has addressed the emergency access fire truck turning radiuses and indicated they would maintain and plow the emergency access way, but the TDE may still have concerns about the width of the access. Okay. Uh, the arrangements of the street shall be uh, as to no cause to undo hardship to adjoining properties and shall be coordinated as so to uh, compose a convenient system. <clears throat> the length of the cul-de-sac is a concern. The sharp bend in the road as it exits Ruffner Road's paper street in essence creates a three front yard for the 1219 Ruffner Road property, which is potentially an unforeseen hardship. Complete Streets Committee felt that there was a lack of connection from this neighborhood to the adjacent neighborhoods and that the configuration is potentially isolating to the residents of the proposed cul-de-sac. Um, proposed walking connection to South Country Club uh, Drive is a benefit of the proposal. Yeah, this is what I'd like to talk about a little bit. It's uh, the uh, finding uh, that we need to address is the arrangement of streets shall be such as to cause no undue hardship to adjoining properties and shall be coordinated so as to compose a convenient system. Um, it states here that, um, um, or in essence, creates three front yards. We had some discussion oh, several meetings ago uh, about this access point. In my understanding, unless it's changed, is that if either of those residents, like the Spain residents and the other home on the other side, um, uh, currently have two front yards if they were apply for a building from it. So they already have two front yards. And my understanding, again, I know it's an impact. I don't take this the wrong way, uh, all of a sudden having a street next to you. But this thing is specifically about undue hardship. They already have two front yards at both of those properties. The one property to the right, I can't recall the number, but the one property to the right, if that road comes around behind that property, there's still Mohawk Golf Club property between that and the residence. So they will not have a third. Uh, if they come in for a building permit and want to put a pole in, there's no third uh, front yard as a result of this. So I, I disagree with this finding. I think it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a change of, of the character and it's uh, uh, different because there's been no road there, but I don't think it's causing an undue hardship because it doesn't change anything if, if either applicant were to come in for a building permit pre or post construction. All right, am I missing something? I'm glad you articulated that. It's a very valid point. Uh, it's just so, in this version, the, the angle of the road had, had changed, right? Well, when the slope when the slope existed, your statement was still true. It just felt like well, the um, it hasn't changed when when uh, we decided you know this board basically gave direction that we didn't like a single family home coming down, and this was a on the on the map and this was an access point. Um, and again, if this access point uh, already has uh, results in two front yards to those two properties, it, it's not really changing anything. I mean, except for. You got a road next year, obviously, which is a big deal. But from a undue hardship and filing for a building permit, it doesn't change anything. So I, I just, I'm, I'm just going to clarify in the discussions that myself and the uh, project leads had on this. It does not legally create three front yards. Um, there's still only legally two front yards. But if you look at the trajectory of the, um, like, of the proposed access, um, and you look at, like, you know stubs that have been created and then and then <clears throat> subdivisions have occurred off of them it's not typical that the road would bend so tightly and that in in essence you're in three like you don't actually legally have three front All right yards, okay but you have a car now that's turning there's actually cars that are going to be driving in three directions around the property and so um yeah, I understand that, but that, that's not what it says, though. Right? So I think what we should add is that the, the, you just add a, add a sentence in there, or two sentences that say that the current residents each have two front yards, and this will not create a third third front yard. That's in, all. In, in, in fairness to the discussion that we had in drafting the statement, that's the reason why we say potentially an unforeseen hardship that will need to be made definitive if this application were to proceed further. Okay, but I still would like this to say that currently both residents have two front yards and this will not uh, result in a third front yard. I think that's, and you can still keep everything else in there that it's, you know, it's not desirable, um, but I think that's important. Does anybody agree with that? It's important to put that in there and to make it clear. 
Yeah. So I think, Chairman Walsh, maybe the right thing to do is to propose it. Yep, okay. no, I'm proposing it. I'm proposing that okay. we state in there that both existing properties currently have two front yards and that this uh, application will not result in a third front yard. You can talk about, you know, everything else can stay, but I just wanted to say, so I'd like to make a motion that we just add that to this finding. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Shall we add this to the finding or do we need to, do we need to vote on it or we just add it or? No, you need to make a motion there needs All to right, be a I'm second. making a motion that we add that, uh, but I just stated to this finding. Do I have a second? I'll second. And we have a second. Okay, all those in favor of amending uh, this finding to just include the statement that both homes currently have two front yards and this application will not result in a third front yard, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 So you don't want to add that fact to the, to the finding. I, I find that troublesome. I do, I, do, I do believe that the language that's been used in essence creates three front yards, potential hardship, to potential unforeseen hardship to the property owner. I think it does cover the legal definition of front yards and the number of front yards. I don't think it does. I, I think the word in essence also is is to be considered because it's not making a hard, it is three, but it says in essence, which gives a little bit of leeway for the subjectiveness of it. In essence, it is. In essence, it is. Yeah, I think it's just important that the town board understand that, though. That's all. That's why yeah, I'm saying it should be in there. It's an important part that, that we bring up, but it seems that the language as it was written aligns closest to our vote. So maybe the town board should, well, should hear that. Well, I think we just voted. Nobody, no, we have a motion in a second. It, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Well, we we'll, yeah. went on record stating it and for the facts, so it's on record. That's all I can say. And... You know, when we developed this this finding, we couldn't think of other properties that had other streets that basically surround a single family oh. home. There's a property that fronts on Providence Avenue, but it also has Newport running on one side and Pawtucket on the other. I think legally that's three front yards. It's a rare circumstance. Right. Yeah. Around three sides of the road. But there are instances. Right. But I but it's a rare circumstance. And or, we want to create it. Or it may be a much larger lot that has a larger right. side lot or something like that. So it I, I agree with I agree with Ms. Robertson. It's it's it probably occurs, but it's very rare. Right. And we haven't done the research to right. to uh, document and, and, and the key point, it's Laura's last statement that she made. I just want to reiterate. Do we want to actively recommend creating that situation? And we also have unresolved widths that are approved by the fire department and, and access and the, well, all those are still up in the air. So that creation potential is even greater in my mind. And those are details that would normally be addressed later on. Yep. So the central like we don't do the full engineering on water and sewer. We're yeah. still at the concept stage, which is essentially where we're at. I mean, we could approve this. The town board could approve it. They go to do the final engineering. If they can't make satisfactory water and sewer hookups, it's gone. What I'm saying is the potential is too high that the design image we see of that road today won't get worse. It's just the potential's there. And that's why I'm saying essentially it could create <clears throat> something that feels like, you know, and I know that feelings, feelings not the word we should go with here. And I agree with Chairman, you know, it's a fine line you know, by, by factual, literal interpretation. But because those unknowns are there and we've seen, we know that the space is a little bit tight. I'm, I'm concerned with, with that. At least that's how I'm looking at it. Okay, Mr. Diopino, continue. <clears throat> All right, next item is the arrangement of streets in the subdivision. So provide for the con continuation of principal streets and adjoining subdivisions and for proper projection of principal streets to, to adjoining properties, which are not yet subdivided in order to make possible necessary fire protection, movement of traffic and construction or extension presently or when later required of needed utilities, public services, others, things such as sewers, waters, drainage facilities. <clears throat> Where in the opinion of the planning board, topographic or other conditions make such continuance undesirable or impractical 
the above condition may be modified. The current arrangement of the long cul-de-sac does not provide for the continuation of principal streets into the adjoining subdivisions. True, the only thing at stake there is that some might consider this a positive, so, you know, that it can't go nowhere. <laughs> Um, the next one is uh, specifically for cul-de-sacs. Where cul-de-sacs are designated to be permanent, they should be in general not to exceed 500 feet in length and shall terminate in a circular turnaround having a minimum right-of-way radius of 60 feet and pavement radius of 45 feet. The current cul-de-sac as proposed is 1,750 feet long. Okay. Um, the next item that focuses on parks, open space, and natural features uh, recreation area is shown on the town plan where a proposed park playground or open space shown on the town plan is located in whole or in part in a subdivision the board shall require that such areas be shown on the plat in accordance with the requirements specified in subsection b below such areas or areas may be dedicated to the town or or county by the subdivider if the board approves such a dedication <clears throat> the finding is that the there is currently no recreation or parkland proposed for the subdivision. Parkland is separate from the open space requirement of an average density development special use permit. Okay, B, uh, parks and playgrounds not shown on the town plan. The subdivider shall dedicate to the town usable land in equal in size to 10% or more of the subdivider's tract. This land shall be used by the town for parks, playgrounds, for use, other specific public recreational uses deemed desirable by the planning board. Usable areas and areas bordering like a stream, lake, or other water course can be given special consideration by the board in excess of 10% minimum. There is currently no recreation parkland proposed for the subdivision. The applicant has discussed requesting a waiver for parks and playgrounds with payment of cash in lieu of land dedication. Okay. Uh, preservation of natural features. The planning board shall, whenever possible, establish a preservation of all natural features which add value to residential developments and to the community, such as large trees, groves, watercourses. A um, couple don't relate here, like beaches and waterfalls, uh, historic spots, vistas, or other similar irreplaceable assets. No tree with a diameter of eight inches or more, as measured three feet above the base of the trunk, shall be removed unless. A tree within its right of way or street is shown on the final subdivision plat. Removal of additional trees subject to the approval of the planning board. Uh, in no case, however, shall a tree with a diameter of five inches or more measured three feet above the base of the trunk be removed without prior approval by the planning board. <clears throat> in those areas where grade contours would be raised, measurements should be taken to ensure against damage or killing of trees, such as measurements uh, shall include but not be limited to construction of wells around the bases of trees and making other provisions. Um, the response to this one was that there's no data available to the planning board at the time concerning the number and sizes and locations of the trees over eight inches, um, the vistas of the golf course and natural forest areas and natural features that add value to the residential development and to the community. As detailed in, in the town's 2013 comprehensive plan, the Mohawk Golf Course is a viable asset and the public-private course network of recreational and open space throughout the town. If not pr protected and developed correctly, the town could lose an irreplaceable asset to the town and surrounding neighborhoods. The planning board finds that this plan does not provide for adequate preservation of natural features and more data on the location of trees, as well as retaining patches of forest within the subdivisions to avoid clear cutting 12 acres as necessary for any proposal within the area. Okay. Mr. Diarpino, before you begin the next section, just one clarification on page five. My apologies to the board. I may have missed it, but did you articulate response to the, at the top of page five to question F, B, lot size variation? Um, Kevin actually summarized that. Um, okay. As long as we feel that that was adequately summarized because it has a bearing, I think, on the general character section. Yeah, three, um, was that 3B? Is that what you're talking about? Yep. So, I'm sorry, it's page five of 10. Yep. At the top of the page. Yep. When it talks about the sizes of the average density development. Correct. They vary. 
versus there are two paragraphs in the findings that I don't recall hearing them. Oh, said. I wonder if that got missed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, could if you don't mind, could we read those and then we can get the general character? Is that okay, Sharon Walsh? Or that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's in the, it's in the public record. Yeah, I just there's I no problem. They were read. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so backing up, this relates to Section 220.28, Average Density Development. And this is in regards to, uh, let's see, get in order here. Uh, that would be F subsection 2B1. <clears throat> okay. Um, the sizes of the lots in the average density development may vary from the normal requirements of the district in which they are located, but no dimension or area requirements for the district shall be reduced by more than 50%. <clears throat> the findings are no area dimension requirements appear to be reduced by more than 50%. The front side and rear setbacks are all proposed to be reduced by the full 50%. The lot frontages and sizes vary from nearly full 50% reduction for the majority of the townhome lots to 10 to 20% reduction on the minimum R1 single family home lots. The average frontage for the lots is approximately 80 feet. The average lot size is approximately 14,850 square feet. The eight smallest lots are between 9,300 and 10,800 square feet. For the existing 12 homes directly adjacent to the average density development proposal, these are the existing homes on Ruffin Road. The average lot size is 26,575 square feet. The average frontage uh, for these homes onto Ruffin Road is 130 feet of road frontage. Uh, for this particular area, this equates to a 60% reduction in lot frontage with the ADD compared with the adjacent homes and a 48 percent reduction in lot size. It basically meets the normal requirement of the district, you know, the 50 percent thing. The second paragraph just relates it to uh, the historic uh, lots on Ruffner Road. Okay. Or in other words, the character of the existing neighborhood. Depends on how you define character. Sure does. We'll, we'll get into that now, it seems. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then um, items two and three both uh, refer to the associated. We did those, okay. So we just missed that one. Yeah. Okay. So back to page nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And B, we, we just said that with B is with the uh, existing neighborhood. Not the not the requirement, which is the uh, zoning, which is R one. Okay. <clears throat> Next section. Yep, please. Okay. All right. So section two twenty sixty special use permit. <clears throat> the first item is specifically the general character. The finding finds that the planning board finds that the general character of this proposed average density development is unsuitable for the location. Typical lot sizes in this area average twenty six thousand five hundred seventy five square feet, with frontages averaging one hundred thirty feet. Proposed lot size average is 14,850 square feet with average frontages of 80 feet. The bulk and scale of the smaller lots will not be in harmony with the surrounding neighborhood. Similar benefits of forest and buffer preservation could be achieved through single family home subdivision, but the clustering and the massing of homes proposed will be markedly different from the surrounding area. There is no discernible benefit to the use of an average density development in this location. Furthermore, the plan does not provide for adequate preservation of natural features and the open space provided is not useful to the majority of the neighborhood. And I will simply note that we installed the average density development as an option for development to increase the green space, to minimize the infrastructure, et cetera. And this does that. And it, appropriate for R1. Yeah, and plus the buffer, which is results from that uh, increased potential of um, due to the smaller lot sizes. And given the residents of Ruffner Road, they make it abundantly clear that they don't want neighbors, it does buffer them. Yes. Okay, uh, height and use of land. 
uh, finding. The planning board finds that the clustering of the improvements is not suitable for this location. The number of units is too high and the configuration does not take advantage of the natural surroundings, including the remaining forest and golf course holes. And I simply disagree. They're not getting any more units to get what they would be allowed. Yeah. Taking advantage yeah. of the average density development. Yeah, the only thing I, I would add is that, again, it's early on in the uh, uh, subdivision process, whether or not it obviously goes forward, but that's, you know, uh, it's still open for discussion, the number of units as we go through the process and, uh, you know, all the other concerns that may be, need to be addressed. So, also true. You know, uh, so, I mean, that's the point that we're at in this uh, process. Okay. Um, next item is buildings and structures. <clears throat> uh, the planning board finds that the single family homes and townhomes being clustered is not consistent with the surrounding neighborhoods and is not the recommended approach. The benefit with this configuration is weighted more towards the developer than the characteristics of the surrounding land and neighborhoods. It just leads me as a reader to say, well, what is the recommended approach? You have to see an application. Though. I know, I just, <laughs> some, something to ponder. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I don't agree with this. Uh, the obvious alternative would be traditional layout, which eats up open space, damages more open space, puts in more infrastructure. Average density development is appropriate to the zoning. And I think it's beneficial to the area. And I don't believe we have a right to say, do you know development would be appropriate that would amount to a taking. We do not have the right to say that. That's not what's worded here. And I, I also, well, I don't. the only okay. other alternative. Okay. So the, the other thing is that we're looking at a net 22 potential R1, single family homes. Yes, and you have, R1. okay. It could be all single family homes, but right now it's 22 yes. units. So I don't see where the significant savings is on the infrastructure that goes in. Because by bringing them close together, you disturb less land. It's still 22 units. But you're still 22 units of of water, sewer. The road didn't shorten all that much. The cul-de-sac goes all the way. You know. Well, when you have a zero side yard setback to the townhomes, that's saving land to Ms. Wood Gold's point. You know? so but, but I'm talking from an infrastructure, not a land use. You, you are, but is, is this finding talking only about infrastructure? Mm -hmm. It says building their structures. I think Mr. Diarpino is referring to Ms. Gold's comment on oh. the infrastructure. Yeah, well, which, I'm just saying that for the comment, you know, uh, zero side yard setback for townhomes, you know, saves <clears throat> that space that you normally would have for, what is it, 20, 20 foot, 25 foot side yard setback for R1 times two. So 50 foot between homes or 40 foot, whatever it is, you know. So Yeah, and, I, and I just want to be clear, you know, we're all here everything's written right. We are not making any recommendation on what kind of application we'd like to see here. Right. This finding strictly relates to the ADD as proposed for this location. Okay. Um, provisions of open space and treatment of the grounds. Uh, the lot is the largest and one of the last open spaces area and the last open space areas in the area. The open space proposed with the ADD is mostly beneficial to a small number of existing homes and does not provide amenity to the majority of the neighborhood. It's strictly related to buffering the negative impacts of this development without providing additional benefit to the neighborhood. Additionally, the open space doesn't provide any value to the golf course because the wooded lot is no longer adjacent to the field of play. As far as habitat preservation is concerned, two acres does not provide the same types of habitat for wildlife as 14 acres and the habitat is fractured, largely linear, and much less useful. Okay. Um, general fitness of the structure or use to its proposed location. As previously documented, the planning board finds that the average density use as configured is not a suitable use for this proposed location. Yeah, it's previously stated. I disagree. Okay. Uh, provision for automobile parking or storage. 
The provision for automobile parking and storage is adequate. Uh, street capacity and use, the planning board recommends an actual traffic study on Ruffner Road to determine the full impacts of adding vehicles and intersections to this area. Um, public health and convenience, the planning board finds that this proposal has little impact on public health. And preservation of general character of the neighborhood, as previously documented, the planning board finds that this proposal is contrary to the preservation of general character of the neighborhood. And we disagree with that statement as well. I think the buffering addresses that in a large part. Plus, it's R1 next to R1. It's same character. Okay. And the last item are additional findings. And the next item is the town designated engineer's most recent review letter. No, I don't think we need to, to go through that. That's in the packet. So everybody has that. And uh, obviously the uh, applicant gave us an update um, during the discussion period of this resolution. Um, all the f findings are summarized in the resolution from uh, the different uh, boards, Conservation Advisory Council, I believe the Tree Council, et cetera. So it's all, it's all in the package uh, and available for the public to look at anytime. And it's, it'll be with no modifications based on the vote, this will go forward you know, as written to the town board. Okay. Guess I'm gonna take the vote unless anybody wants to make any statements before I call for the roll. Or you can make your statement after you vote. How's that? All right. All right, Mr. Henry, please call the roll. Mr. Laflamme. Aye. By the way, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, an aye vote is that the, the town, we recommend uh, that the town board deny the special use permit. Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. Darpino. Aye. Ms. Gold. Nay. Um, I believe we're, is it Mr. Drescher? Aye. Chairman Walsh? No, Ms. Strang, please. Oh, Ms. Strang? Aye. Chairman Walsh? Uh, no, and I'm gonna at least give some comments why no. Um, along with Leslie, I, you know, <laughs> I have to agree that, uh, you know, it's R1, we're not giving direction to the applicant on what the future holds, but I am concerned what the future holds. And I think the average density development is uh, more suitable than what could be developed there. Um, and, and I think the thing we have to realize here is that this is preliminary. This is just a work in progress. You know, We've got a lot of work ahead of us if the town board were to send this back to us uh, with an approval. We still have a lot of engineering to do. Um, you know, and there's lots of things that could change. We, as, as we just discussed, uh, traffic study needs to be done. We could end up, uh, uh, based on the SWIP, uh, reducing the number of lots. We still have to go through the full sub subdivision approval process if it were to come back to us from the town board, which would include another public hearing. All right. Um, I think we have an opportunity with the average density development to work through this and, and to continue to improve on it. Again, again, it's early in the process and uh, the full engineering hasn't been accomplished. One thing I think is also important is that we have not granted site plan or a sketch approval to this, this development. So this is basically just preliminary um, proposal by the applicant that we're utilizing to make the recommendation, but it's subject to change, all right? Um, I think we have an opportunity about limiting future extensions of this subdivision, uh, whether it be an average, you know, for the average density development and the roads. And I think we can condition that to, to prevent growth, at least from this location. Um, and I think we have, so we, I think we have opportunities. Um, I think the buffer is the key to minimizing the visual and the noise for the neighborhood. And that's not guaranteed. It's, it's possible, but it's not guaranteed but other types of development, including R1 development. For those engineering issues that we have, they're gonna need to be addressed whether, no matter you know, what happens in the future, if this, if, if this application were to go forward in a different uh, application, such as an R1 development, we're still gonna to have to address um, all those concerns. And some of them could be showstoppers, like the length of the cul-de-sac. You know, we, again, we don't have all the final details on uh, wh whether that's suitable, whether the emergency access is gonna be adequate. Uh, you know, what's the recommendation? We haven't gotten that far. 
And I do think that uh, uh, this provides some diversity in housing with the townhouses. Uh, if I understand things correctly, and well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's anywhere in our zoning code that just allow, allows a townhouse. Anywhere that a townhouse is proposed, it needs to have a uh, side yard setback variant. So it needs to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals unless it's probably with a PUD or an average density development. Those are the only places that we can have townhomes. And that's what this application is for. And there's the benefits of the townhomes with the diversity in housing and with the uh, no side yard setback and minimizing the use of uh, real estate in order to achieve uh, 22 units. Um, so, I mean, and the other thing I got in my notes is that, you know, we still got to go through an ARB review. The ARB did a preliminary review, but when we get down to, um, if it were to get down again, it has to go through the town board. Um, we could, you know, we could talk uh, deeper um, about the style of homes, whether the homes need to be staggered to get a better view of the golf course um, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a, a long way to go in this um, if the town board allows us to go forward with this. And that's why I'm voting no at this point in time. Chairman Walsh, may I make a comment? I sure will accept if you tell me no. No, you, you can make comments. Okay, it's, it's, I agree with, and you're absolutely factual on all of the process statements that you made. And obviously the, you know, your opinion on the subjective aspects of it are, are yours and well-respected. However, we are at the process, we are at that part of the process where we've done the engineering iterations to the level at which the applicant has accommodated us. We've got the TDE to come in to give us the evidences to the level at which that is needed for us. And I'm speaking here as a project co-lead with Mr. DiArpino to be able to make that recommendation to the town board. And so I think that's the only matter in front of us, right? All of the other subsequent process steps are well understood and well defined based on that outcome. But based on that engineering work that was done by the TDE, by the applicant, the assessments and discussions by the board, we've, the only process is making a recommendation. Yeah, and no problem, it's just as preliminary engineering, there's still a lot to do is my point. The other thing is the town board, you know, obviously when they take action, they have three alternatives, right? They can, you know, uh, take the recommendation from this board um, and, you know, it doesn't go forward as an average density development. They can approve it or they can approve with condition which we have seen in the past, such as with Kelts Farm. So if the town board so chooses, this could come back to us with whatever you're, you can imagine, you know, different access point, types of homes, number of housing, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how much authority they have legally, but uh, they do have that potential. Agreed. Thank you, Chairman Walsh. All right, and I appreciate it. So the, uh, uh, the resolution passes by a vote of five to two, and that is a negative recommendation to the town board. So thank you, everybody, for, for your hard work on this, and thank you for everybody for coming out. We appreciate it. And this will be moved on town board, so it probably won't be on our agenda for a while, but uh, it will be uh, coming up on a town board whenever they uh, have their uh, agenda meeting. And it's not, it's, not, it's not on tomorrow night, right? So it'll probably be June, I would imagine. It would be on the town board agenda. Okay. All right? They only have one meeting in June. And they have one, yeah. So probably not for It'll be the end, of, the end of June, the later meeting. And that would just start the process for, for the town board. Okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. I'll give it a second for the room to clear and we will move on the agenda. That's the way it works. Yep. Yep. It's okay. All good. Okay. okay, so we're going to keep moving forward. Please, uh, if you want to speak, close those doors and step outside the uh, meeting room, please. All right, next uh, up we have uh, we have no new business, and we'll move on to discussion item. The first discussion item being Antonia Park, Postnelli Drive, an application uh, for approval of a plat plan for the minor subdivision to a lot minor subdivision, a lot line adjustment. And we have the applicant and the applicant's engineer, Mr. Steinberg, here. So I think, uh, much, you know, I know you've been working hard on this. I've seen a lot of the emails. Um, so I could probably just give the, the board an update of what's been going on yeah, um, and where we're going forward. Brett Steenberg, engineer for the applicant. The, after the last meeting, uh, Mr. Polsonelli went to his potential purchasers, 
um, as was suggested by this board to try to come up with, hey, listen, what's the footprint of the house that you're going to have on the, the property? Um, they sent him back a footprint, which would be the largest house that they could would potentially build. And we put that on the plan. It is a large footprint. It's over 4,000 square feet and um, has a four-car garage um, to model our stormwater after. On top of that, we added an additional uh, buffer for, you know, um, hardscape around the house, which I've never actually done before in a drainage study, but we did it because we want to make sure that this board feels comfortable, that the residents feel comfortable, the neighbors feel comfortable with the, the potential design. Then we also took a look and he spoke with them about instead of having two 15 foot wide separate driveways with grass strip between them, having one 18 foot wide, nine foot on each property um, driveway most of the way before it splits to each house which it reduces some of the impervious area, um, which is, to be honest with you, the most critical area is the driveway because it's it's tough to pick up that water coming down. Um, and we did that. Um, and then we spent some time trying to coordinate a meeting with everyone, as uh, some of you I know were, were on that uh, doodle chain. Um, yeah. We were never able to get a time to meet, so I picked up the phone to call Doug Cole to go through some of the technical issues. Um, I went through the technical issues with him, I did explain to him the sensitivity, and I know probably staff has um, explained to him as well, the sensitivity of the drainage in this area and wanted to make sure that he was on board with, you know, doing what he needed to do for the review. At that point, I went back, I redesigned the system slightly, um, same, same concept, but slight redesign, rotating the basins a little bit. Um, increased the size of the basins, added another six inches of stone in it. It's four and a half feet now instead of four. Um, and to see just how much of when we start looking at these rainfall events, what we could pick up. Now, as we talked about before, there's there's typically two design points that you, that you look at. You have your overbank flood protection, which is your 10 year storm. And that's DEC's overbank flood protection um, numbers. And then you have your extreme flood protection, which is your 100 year storm. Typically, you, when you design, you design your primary outlet to control the overbank flood protection. So, and then you have an emergency overflow for those extreme flood events. That's what we've proposed in this particular layout. Um, the, what we, and then in keeping with that, I spent a lot of time thinking maintenance, 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 because that was another concern by this board was how is this going to be maintained? And, and looking at the, the different variations of, okay, if I'm a homeowner, what do I really want to maintain? Um, so what we ended up doing, instead of having a um, closed system, and I, I know in Doug's initial email, he had, you know, why don't you use dry swales? The slopes are too steep for dry swales. Why am I not just using swales along the side of the driveway? Because swales can overtop, you see it everywhere. They, I mean, you see it on Rosendale Road when we get a gully wash or thunderstorm. It overtops the, the inlet structure, goes over the road. So what I'm proposing are stone trenches along the side of the road. You pitch the, actually, this one's not taking any driveway drainage. Um, the reason we have that is because we have to control all this runoff coming off the side of the hill. We've got to pick that up somehow um, to try to, so, so this system actually ends up a little bit bigger, even though all the driveway drainage goes into this system and a stone trench on either side. That stone trench is a continuous inlet structure. I love them because when you, when you put water into stone, it doesn't flow on top of it. It goes down. And even, even if the stone gets clogged here, it's, it's clear further down. Um, that being said, we have designed the system with a maintenance uh, protection, which is, three inches of river stone, decorative river stone, um, to make it so that it doesn't look like you have, you know, number three crushed stone at the edge of your driveway all the time. Layer of filter fabric that prevents sediment from getting down into that. If that ever needs to be maintained, it's very easy. I, I've done it numerous times, I, I couldn't even tell you, on um, uh, French drains because people like it because they can pull back the stone or pull back the, the fabric, clean the stone, put fabric back down, put new stone down, if it ever becomes clogged. But again, this is a continuous inlet structure. I don't foresee in my lifetime, unless there's some extraneous circumstances where that would ever actually become clogged, where it wouldn't take the water to the structure that it needs to take it to. 
Um, then what that does is it takes the water um, into it, that actually that stone actually after the filter fabric blends in to the stone in the attenuation basis. So basically any water that ends up in that filter fabric goes into that attenuation base. And I, did, do you happen to have those sketches I sent over on Saturday morning? Because I think those, those show it the best. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Yeah. Brett, the decorative stone that's, oh, rock that's over the stone, would that be raised above grade? Would that protrude up so that nothing would cover it like dirt? Uh, it, it could. I, 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 would it interfere with the snow removal or it, the snow storage? Yeah, you, you might knock it down when you're falling. I know from my own driveway, when I fall the driveway, it ends up getting knocked aside. So the design doesn't require that it's it up. Does not big, I'm, I'm envisioning big rocks that can't I'm get actually, moved. I actually have it with, no, it, it, they're, you know, okay. stone about, you know, inch, two inch in diameter, about the size of number three stone. Um, and I actually am envisioning, envisioning a slight trench there. So you, you are containing that before it goes anywhere else. So it's getting into that stone and there's actually a little bit of depth there just to, to ensure that, that you don't have, um, yep. Well, there's like three of them. Uh, any one of them is fine. Yeah. They, they tend to go through each storm event. We can, we can go through that. Okay. Um, this is the, the overbank flood uh, protection. So essentially you have this stone trench, which on lot one is picking up the slope coming off of, you know, the hillside. Mm -hmm. um, on lot two, it's actually picking up um, the majority of the driveway, um, or actually all of the driveway. Um, that picks that up and, and eventually puts it right into the stone, basically a stone basin, underground stone basin. Um, the other aspect is your roof runoff, um, your footing drains, um, any hardscape you have around the house um, with a gutter downspout and direct pipe connection to a catch basin uh, located at the, at the lower side of that um, stone attenuation basin. Um, the, one of the things that Doug recommended, and I entirely agree, is that we require that there be um, leaf guards on the roof gutters because that just helps keep debris out of the system. Um, that would be directly piped into the catch basin, um, which is shown right, right here. That'll be directly piped into the catch basin. This basin will have an, a 12 inch outlet pipe. And the reason it's a 12 inch outlet pipe is because that's less likely to be problematic in the future. If debris gets in there, it's gonna get pushed out of there. If we put a three inch outlet pipe in there, it's eventually going to clog. So what, and, and you do this on stormwater management basins, I can tell you um, almost all the stormwater management basins that we designed uh, in the last 20 years have some sort of control where they actually have an oversized outlet pipe to allow. So what that'll have is a cap with a three inch orifice cut in it. And that's your controlling orifice. It allows the water to go through. Um, and one thing I did do in this recent iteration that actually wasn't on the full set of plans that I sent to the town and Doug because I just did this Saturday morning, um, thinking again, maintenance, prevention of clogging, making sure that debris does not get into the system is we're adding a two foot sump in the bottom of the basin, which is basically meaning that the water level will always be two feet. And what that allows is any heavy sediments that would sink to, okay. to go to the bottom of the basin. It could eventually be vacuumed out. Uh, simple, I mean, vacuumed out, cleaned out, you can actually reach in. It's not that big or yeah. significant that you can't just clean it out yourself. And then every one of these outlet structures would have what's called a snout. The, all that is is basically a plastic baffle that goes over the outlet structure, extends below the water level. So now you get floating debris, leaves, grass clippings, whatnot. <clears throat> it's not flowing into the outlet structure. It's also, as this outlet structure fills up, each one of these um, stone attenuation basins have a six, uh, six inch diameter um, perforated, three of them perforated under drain pipe. So that's, it's backing up into that stone. Each one of those perforated under drain pipes has a clean out, which goes to grade. So that if anything would ever clog in those, it could be cleaned out from the up, up land side, blown right into the catch basin, cleaned out of the system. 
Um, it's actually very simple to do. It's just a hose jet. Um, I mean, town has a great, fantastic one. I know they do. Um, but it doesn't even need to be that that substantial to, to clean out a six inch underdrain. One thing I do want to know, and one thing that we're very careful on, is we want to make sure that this stone doesn't get compromised in any way, where you get sediment, silt, uh, debris into the stone. So that stone is an enclosed encased system that's encased by fabric all the way around on all sides. The underdrain pipe will be wrapped in fabric so that anything that's in that pipe can't get into the stone. Um, there'll be fabric, there'll be a fabric layer around there, um, which would be separating any sediment from coming down from that drain, as well as you know anything from that. The only potential locations for clogging would be into those under drain pipes. Those, and we have three of them in each basin. Um, and I will tell you, probably one would work, but we have three. We want redundancy. And that, that outlet, that three inch orifice, which should be easy to identify and easy to pick up. So basically, as you go through these drawings, this slowly fills up. We've designed the system so that this catch basin structure, which is at the bottom of the hill, which has an open grade on it, um, doesn't get inundated until after you get past the overbank flood condition, which is typically what you do. And that would be our emergency overflow control. That was part one, just to make sure that we've got, that we can maintain that 10 year storm and still not be exceeding that. And we started adjusting the stone, the, the amount of stone, the dimensions of the system. Um, this is, this would be the hundred year storm. I can tell that right away. Um, there's the 10 year storm. So as you look, the 10 year storm, that basin fills up the 48 inches of stone or 54 inches of stone fills up with water. That's a 3.65 inch rainfall. Um, we're decreasing the flow off site. I, I don't have those numbers right in front of me significantly based upon that, but from, from what the existing conditions are. Now we needed to look at the 100 year storm event, the, the extreme flood event. Mm -hmm. And as you tasked me to do, I looked at it for various storm events. I looked at it for the, what, what I trust as the, the best data out there, which is the Cornell mean tables, which is what we've been using. Um, we looked at the DEC tables, which are 20 years old and outdated. It says it right in the Cornell um, documentation. And then we looked at the 7.44 which is the, extru the, the, at the cutoff at which point where they take, because when they, I, it's been a long time since I've taken probabilities and statistics. So I read through it and was like, okay, yeah, I can remember some of that stuff, but this, this, is, this is not something I do every day. The, the way they, the, the data is interpreted through a calculation based upon rainfall and rain gauges throughout the area. The, um, and you get, a lower confidence and an upper confidence limit when you look at that and you get that bell curve and you know the the 7.44 is that upper confidence limit anything that's more than that the data is tossed out it's it's no they don't consider it viable so we ran it for the 7.44 and we got the system to work at the existing conditions just a slight decrease it's a two percent decrease it's not not significant but it's a slight decrease for that rainfall event um, and I will note, in the last 84 years, the most rain the Albany County has, Airport has seen since they've been keeping record is 5.6 inches of rain. Even Irene? Irene was actually less than that. Irene was actually, I think, 5.4 in 24 hours. Um, <clears throat> that uh, This was a late, I want to say late 90s, 97, 98 or something, um, a, a rainfall event of 5.6 inches at Albany County Airport. And that's since they've been keeping records since 1939. That's the most they've seen. So I, I feel confident in the numbers we're using and the data we're using, even going up to that 7.44 inches of rainfall. So now we're looking at it from a maintenance standpoint. How do we handle the maintenance on this? Okay. I've already talked a lot about the safety factors we've put in there, the snout, the three under drain pipes, the filter fabric around the whole system, the leaf guards on the, to try to reduce any potential for contamination to the system. Should there be contamination in the system? 
it's easy. You lift the cap, you clean out the, the, the system flow. I don't personally thinking about this as very similar to a septic system in ideal situation, in ideal circumstances, not the septic system in silty clay, but the septic system in beautiful loamy sand that the person pumps every, you know, annually and is properly sized. What's the longevity of that? 30, 50 years. I know people never, never even had considered to replace them in, in those situations. Similar scenario here. We are creating the ideal situation because we're adding the filter fabric. We're, we're making those preventative measures. I don't think it would ever clog to a point where it would adversely affect the runoff in my lifetime. However, we will know in the um, operation maintenance manual that they're to be cleaned every 10 years, that basically those under drain pipes will be cleaned out every 10 years. I think probably annually the homeowner go down, pull the cover on that basin, take a look in that basin, make sure that the sediment hasn't built up in that basin. You know, you, you don't know they, the yard clippings, they, it, it's going to get in there. It's going to get, it's going to sink to the bottom. It's going to, that stuff gets cleaned out. We're trying to keep it away. It's actually in a stone area so that you're not going to get a lot of yard clippings, but it happens. Um, you may get a few leaves in there, but probably not a lot because of the, the, the way the system's designed. It's not, it's not an open swale that tends to convey the leaves. It's, um, and so we'll add that in to the, to the operations and maintenance manual. I did call around to another municipality who has a lot of on-site residential stormwater um, applications. How, how do you handle this? Every single one of them is it's a deed restriction. Um, and I know this, I actually have a two lot subdivision colony right now. It's to be deed restricted. They have some dry swales. They have some. Um, and, and actually, they have a runoff concern as well as a water quality concern. Um, they're handling it as a deed restriction. I know Colony has also lots with rain gardens on them. They handle it with deed restrictions. Um, reviewing New York State DEC's documentation. I didn't actually speak with Dave Gasper. Um, it was on my list of people to call, and I didn't get around to it. But they require deed restrictions if this were a DEC permittable system. That's how it would be handled if it were on private property. Uh, New York State DEC stormwater management practice is to be deed restricted for maintenance purposes. So I feel confident that that's the best um, mechanism to ultimately ensure the maintenance of the system. And I feel like we're at a point in the design um, and speaking with Doug and going through all of this that we feel very comfortable and confident, and, and I'm hoping that this board feels that way as well with the, the stormwater management design that we've proposed. <clears throat> Will we be getting a, uh, a sign off from the TDE saying that they're um, reviewed uh, the latest information and, and they're happy, whatever word you want to use, content that it meets requirements, whatever? Yeah, they have, um, <clears throat> they sent a draft, which I haven't reviewed yet. And Mr. Pulsinelli came by on Monday morning and um, increase the TDE fund. So we're all set. I would expect that letter very soon. Okay. That's encouraging. Uh, obviously, you've done a tremendous amount of work. Thank you. I appreciate going to the 100 year storm figure. I have one disappointment because we normally stay away from shared driveways. <laughs> that was Is my that comment. Critical to making this work. I think it's, uh, and, and I'll let Mr. Polsonelli explain it because it, it was actually a, a, a question I had because I'm trying to reduce the amount of storm water. So I'm trying to reduce the impervious area when I saw the footprints of the house. The persons, pers the, the people purchasing the house, uh, Mr. Polsonelli, are brothers. So that is the reason that we felt comfortable going with the shared driveway. I did widen it from what a typical 16 foot driveway would be to 18 feet so that each person had an, at least nine feet on their property line. Should somebody decide to put a block wall up between it, which I've seen on the internet from time to time, I don't anticipate that to happen. I, I understand your concern. I, I try to stay away from them initially as possible, but then you look at DEC's recommendations in their share the driveways as much as possible, reduce the width of the driveways, reduce the, the length of the driveways as much as possible. So we're, we're kind of fighting a what works in the real world versus what works. And I, I, think, I think we're actually at a good compromise with that and being that the purchase 
are okay with that. Um, they're purchasing the lots for themselves to build it to, to reside there. I don't know if it's still the law, but it was the law that you actually could not put a fence or a wall. There on may it. be. There may be. I just see these horror stories on the internet all the time that other states know. allow it. I know. Yeah. So, but uh, I actually grew up with a shared driveway. It actually was great. We had an older, uh, older, uh, elderly woman who lived next to us and it was one of these situations where of course in the day you know my dad cleaned out her driveway as she hold her steps and then when my mother got older her neighbor did it for her it was kind of actually a nice uh nice situation but um you know but you have to be able to get along with your neighbors to do something like that that's that's what that's what excuse me let's say i mean to interrupt but um in my previous life as a daytime court stenographer Shared driveways are a nightmare in small claims court. Um, you've got, you know, that's wonderful, they're brothers, but let's face it, the possibility of one of the brothers, something happening, somebody sells their, their house or what have you, and there's always a war. Who's going to clean the bottom part of the driveway? Shared driveway or you're on my property or whatever, the, whatever you know, what have you. But I can tell you, I can't count how many of those I heard in small claims court as, as issues. So is is there any way just to take that that green strip and just pull it right down the center, at least to have that boundary? We could do that. I could what I could do is increase the width to 10 feet, put a stone strip down the center. I mean, I know it sounds menial, it's, but I, I think it, it would what'll end up happening is probably they'll end up paving it over and making it one driveway, um, just knowing that they're brothers. Um, which would the the day, which would defeat the purpose. Which would defeat the purpose. Yeah. Um, it, I, but if it was deed restricted, then it couldn't that couldn't happen, correct? That is correct. I is, mean, it, I, is there gonna be a shared agreement even though they're brothers in case, you know, twenty years from now they downsize? They downsize. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Any thoughts on that, Fred? I have a 600 foot driveway in my own house and it's nowhere near 18 feet. Um, so I would say keep the same pavement width, have a separation between the two driveways of two feet, and then you've got two separate driveways, but the same pavement width, so your calculations okay. are all the same. Yeah, we, we can do that. We can keep doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Fred, it was easier because I, I understand yeah, where you're at. You can certainly do that. You don't need a driveway. Yeah. Yeah, just to make it objective, if you were to do what Mr. Paulsonelli suggested based on the prompting from the planning board, nothing changes in your calculations, right? Nothing would change in the calculations. Yeah, I, so I'd recommend then that that's that. the better way to go. We, we, we can't leave it up to, um, and obviously, <laughs> you know, the tunnel, if people want to pave over their stone in the driveway, well, that's a, there'll be a town building department problem. And, and the, width, <laughs> the width of Paulsonelli can accommodate the two? Yes, it does. Actually, we have two 50-foot driveways. Two. Yeah, two was always there originally, which yeah. is, yeah. And, and I'm strictly coming from, you know, agreement with Ms. Gold that in our planning principles, right, to share driveway is regardless of, they could be brothers forever and love each other, but at the end of the day, we have to do what's, uh, what makes sense for the town. Understood. That's, that, that's as long, long as it doesn't change your calculations, that was a key uh, thing. We'll, we'll, if it changes the calculations, we'll make the, the necessary changes accordingly, okay. but I will run that through, because I do want to make them at least 10 feet. Okay. Um, nine feet is a little narrow. Yes. Um, I'll make them 10 feet with a two foot separation distance. Mm -hmm. That extra foot likely won't change anything. We've got a little bit of buffer, especially on the, on the one that's taking all the driveway drainage. So I don't anticipate a problem. I just haven't run the numbers yep. after that. And, and in between will be permeable, but drivable if necessary. Yes. Yeah, it'll be, Perfect. it'll be like a, 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 probably a Riverstone center strip. So, so they'll both be pitched inward. Um, no, actually I'm probably going to pitch them both towards that other, the, to keep that on the outbound side. Or you're still going to keep the second on the outbound side? side from a drainage standpoint, yep. because it just, it, it works that way. And I, mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to have that, but because what, what's going to happen is that stone strip is going to be straddling the property line. And if that's an integral part of the stormwater management system, who's not, now we're, now yeah. we're talking about no, 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 yeah, you the ownership sure. maintenance of that. So I don't want to get into that. Let's keep it one. And yeah. we'll, we'll just pitch it in that direction. Yeah, you need to make sure the water you're planning to go to your is need go need to go to the exactly. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to you don't want to go in somewhere else. No, it's no, good. I agree. Um, for the reserve, Miss Gold said it. I I do appreciate the engineering rigor and openness that you did here. I, I mean, you know, and we've talked about it before in this planning board, and you know, Laura and I had a conversation about it too. As far as I'm concerned, I think for this development, the application in front of us, I think this is more than adequate and in response to what we look for.
I think the message back to the town is, you know, the, the next time someone comes up in this area, which it's still open for, right? We, we really need to look at the town being able to, you know, permanently fix the railroad, the Santonia Drive area, Vincenzo's area, right? We got we we got to do something at the town level, right? I I would expect another application comes before us in this vicinity. I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, Mr. Khan. One thing I would love to see is that there's a maintenance spring and fall on that culvert because I think that's uh, it, almost every <clears throat> issue I've run into where we've had flooding. I'm not even talking about just here. I'm talking, I've got a Popeye's restaurant going in Kirk, New York that I have to go to tomorrow. Um, it was, they had a flooding issue. A mattress got in the big culvert pipe and clogged the culvert pipe. Maintenance of culverts and drainage ways is key to, and that's why, you know, I spent so much time thinking about various things that we could do to make, to, to reduce the maintenance. Um, that one culvert, I think, looking back, what I've heard is that it was clogged. It, it does. It happens. And that's what, what, you know, I think, I think that would be a good start. And then looking, you know, like you said, who mm -hmm. knows with additional developments, but. And w as far as maintenance goes for the, the one, the system you showed us, is it something that a homeowner could do portions yes. of, or would they always have to get some money? No, actually the, as far as the annual maintenance with the catch basin, that's, that's easy. It's okay. with the catch basin, go down get, you know, clean out, make sure everything's, everything's operating properly. If they were to notice that the water wasn't backing up into the system as, as designed, which would be pretty easy to notice because it's going to start to flood that basin pretty quickly, um, then they could get a, it's, it's a sewer jet company. The same thing you do when your septic system clogs up for the first time, you end up sewer jetting out the lines. <clears throat> the only difference with this is um, with a septic system, all the water goes out of the bottom of the pipe through little holes. This is perforated all the way around. So as that bottom, if that bottom were to ever silt in, you still got the top of the pipe. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what in theory will happen over time is you get that 10 year rainstorm, the 3.65 inches of rain, that basin fills up. You've got a lot of head pressure on that pipe coming down through those perforations in the hole, and it's going to flush out that system. The more frequent, the larger rainfall events, the more it's going to flush out that system. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, should we get a lot of storms where we don't get that big flushing system? they may have to hire a sewer jet company. And that's why I'm saying uh, possibly every 10 years, I don't think it's going to need to be that, but we'll add it in there just for safety purposes to come in and just be, basically it's a 50 foot hose with a pressure washer on the end of it. They shove it down there. It sprays everything out the end, cleans all, all around and pull it up. There's numerous companies in the area which do it. Hardest part's taken off the cover to check it. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> probably is the hardest part. Okay. I just had uh, two quick comments. I haven't run this past Ray, but you still need to just kind of pocket out yeah. where the snow is going to go on the end of Pulse Nelly Drive because it looks tight now to me with the fire hydrant. <clears throat> and yeah, it actually, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it can actually go on top of this basin um, for, for most intense purposes. There's actually a lot of area between where this basin's gonna go still. Yeah, right away. I was looking on this side. So on this this side, this side gets a little tighter, but there's still a lot of right away there. We don't have driveways, unlike um on uh Vincenzo. Right? Yeah, Vincenzo. There were driveways coming out in that particular location. We don't have driveways. There's a lot of right away on that on both sides of the that um uh the the the, the asphalt to, to of the stub of, of the of the stub there i mean of the stub yeah just for um just because well, i think having it on a map helps highway like well, we can just send it out to them if you can just bubble out where's absolutely. the good snow storage that way we can double check it with them and then if they're like yep that's fine then when they're getting new plow drivers or whatever they can just hand them the map that has the snow storage absolutely we could okay. certainly do that and then the other thing is um, the engineering department wanted to remind me that we can just put it as a condition of the subdivision approval. I do think there was a lot of really good work done on the drainage. And um, I know Clark had a really good, robust discussion with our TDE about it today. 
Um, as far as the sewer connections go to the line um, that the DEC is monitoring because of the concern that it's full, it's still not completely, it's still a little bit up in the air. So um, uh, approval would have to be something like, you know, subject to a DEC approval for the connections to this line. Our engineer has reached out to DEC multiple times about it, and um, he's just not able to get a clear answer. So I don't think that it needs to hold this project up, but it will need to be a condition of the resolution. The town may not be able to approve sewer connections right away. Is, is it that he's not getting a response from the DEC or that they're just not clear in their response? So the DEC essentially issued us a letter when we approved Kelts Farm for the line that goes from Kelts Farm yeah. to the wastewater treatment plant is at capacity right. once Kelts Farm is done. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's in this weird nebulous place of Kelts Farm isn't done. So when we're doing the monitoring right now and saying that the line isn't full, they're saying there's still homes to be built that we've already approved. And so like sliding these homes into that mix, um, it's been it's been a constant kind of conversation with them and we have yet to get approval for these two homes. Right. Right. And I, I did speak with, with Matt and some length about that. Um, I feel pretty confident based on my discussions with him that there's going to be capacity there um, based on the monitoring that he's done. He just needs to get confirmation from Kevin O'Connor at DC and isn't getting the answers that he, that, you know, the responses. Right. But we need to be able to show that there's still margin on capacity with these two homes plus Kelp Farm. Right. Yeah. So I, I can see, yeah, so I can I, see why the DEC would be hazy on this. Well, I actually agree with what um, Brett just said though. The town has installed monitors. <coughs> Sorry. And the data, the current data that we've been getting has been pretty favorable. Yeah. Um, but it I just want everybody to understand, the applicant to understand that it's not approved. <laughs> I don't think it holds up the con the concept of the subdivision. I think we worked really hard on it. It looks really good. <coughs> I just want to let you know that there'll be some kind of a note about it if we propose a resolution. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 it might not be forthcoming. <coughs> And we we understand that it's um you know I, I think um I feel confident that there's going to be capacity there based upon the information that I've been given thus far um as far as the the what the, the monitoring has shown yeah I just I mean it's it's a 15 inch I think it's a 15 inch sewer main it's, it's right. I mean it's going to be whatever houses are on there now plus the remaining plus, the Kells Farm has to build out plus these two plus these two um and it's and and you know as as I as I stated previously, um, DEC typically holds you to 80% capacity, 80% mm -hmm. capacity of a 15 inch line um, to, to, to trigger that threshold from 80% to 81% far exceeds the amount of effluent from these two houses from the design. Um, and the other thing, and I, and I talked to Matt about it and I don't, I don't believe he's gotten out there and I haven't taken a look at it, but there's a sewer stub on this site. Um, my experience with sewer stubs that are left without manholes and caps in the ground they leak over time i don't know when that was installed this could <coughs> actually improve the situation um in the long run there may be i and i coming into that sewer stub um as as a result uh but it's something that hasn't been investigated yet and we can investigate that should become a issue that's like a bargaining chip it's easy sometimes i know yeah Okay. okay, so we can at least call for a tentative resolution. Absolutely. Okay, I'd appreciate that. All right, and we'll obviously hear back from the TDE, get the sign off, and anything that you uh, left open will condition, and uh, as, as we typically do, and, okay. and hopefully we'll have it because uh, we got three weeks between now and the next meeting. But as we all know, it goes fast. Yeah, I know. I do know how that goes. And, and that's June twelfth, right? Uh, no, it's uh, June. Yes, June twelfth. Sorry, June twelfth. Okay. Three weeks. From I'm just. Today. I'm just trying to think. If, uh, Three I, weeks. Yep. Hopefully, I can either be here remotely or be here. I, yep. I'm, and I've known you got a couple of thanks already, but I'd also like to oh. express my thanks for your hard work, yeah. uh, especially Mr. Pulsinelli. Yeah, you know, you know it's uh, gone above uh, beyond my view, and uh, we appreciate it. And uh, good project. Sounds good. Yep.
well as the homeowners. Mm. I think we've got a pretty good balance here. Yep. Mm. Well, you, you hired a good engineer, Mr. Balsinelli, so. Yep. You did. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Done a, res a resolution for next meeting. Sounds good. Appreciate your time this evening and uh, look forward to seeing you at the 12th. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. That's it for discussion items. And we'll move right into reports or planning department. Do you have anything, Laura or Mr. Henry? Uh, I sent it out in an email, but just a reminder, the second meeting in June has to be canceled due to early voting. And there isn't a way to reschedule it. Um, just by the way that our meetings fall, it would make two meetings fall within a week, which just isn't enough turnaround for the planning yep. department to put together a meeting. So uh, the June twelfth meeting is actually the only meeting we have in June. I'm sure, everybody's very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, <laughs> I'm sadly <laughs> traveling to Alaska because we have no night meetings. That's <laughs> June twenty sixth. Is canceled. Yeah, yeah. June yeah, the only meeting in June is June 12th. Yep. All right. Or is that before or after the town board meeting? So, um, it actually does not interfere with the town board meeting, I believe. Um, the agenda meetings before the early voting and the regular meeting is actually just as it closes. So, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Potentially, they just move their meeting to Thursday. It's very, very close. Um, we're just not able to reschedule ours. Okay. Anything else for reports, uh, Clark or Laura? No. All right. For commission business, any comments or questions of the planning department? Or I, I don't mean to hold this up. But just one quick thing, continuing on the okay. the, app, the Palestinian application. So, the recommendation that Brett made about cleaning the culverts, town responsibility, <laughs> even what we had talked about prior in the meeting. You know about you know what is that you know construction infrastructure project look like to just get that you know is that how does that get in oh. front of the town i mean did, did somebody make a proposition that, to, to, um do you mean adjusting the code to make our code stronger on talking about cleaning the no, no, no 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 i'm talking about cleaning, the cleaning this whole railroad paulsonelli Vincenzo. Yeah. Oh. yeah 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 um so i've actually been discussing it with the with our um town engineer and our highway superintendent I think they feel very strongly that a lot of the issue is still um, kind of maintenance of the open channel behind Rao Road and that they really, I mean, potentially either the town or the other neighbors really need to work on outreach. Um, but I still feel um, that it's, wor it's worthwhile for the town to look at some kind of like climate smart or resiliency grant in the face of, you know, the intensity of storms that's increasing. Um, if I find something really good, I'll probably still bring it up. But I definitely, um, in my discussions with them, they feel very strongly that maintenance of that open channel is a huge part of the issue down there. Yeah, so that's the thing I'm struggling with. So when you say maintenance of the open channel, you mean a, re a responsibility of the residents? Yeah, so I mean, what I think really ends up frustrating them is that this channel needs the ability to shrink and grow during the storms. And that when people kind of push their leaves or their glass clippings or their branches towards the back of their property, it's not necessarily in the stream channel, but it's where it grows and constricts. It gets picked up in the heavy storms and becomes problematic. Um, that's what I understand from them. I still feel like um, if I can, um, if there's things that we can do, you know, through resiliency, climate resiliency grants or something like that, I'd still like to explore them. Um, but I but I do want to reiterate, I was even talking to them about this morning, that they stress to me maintenance, um, private property maintenance a lot. Okay, so, but the other the other dimension on this, which is what you're saying, you'd like to get through a grant, which is a budget funding. Yeah. Would we then re-engineer that open channel to, so, to remove that burden from residents? Or? Well, I mean, what I would like to see is I think, you know, outreach for maintenance can kind of occur generally. One thing that I did hear one of the residents say, which I don't think the town has verified, is that kind of almost regardless of maintenance, when they were on the other side of that culvert, the water was coming out full. I think he said that here a couple times. Um, and so if it's coming out full on the other side, then it's not a, cl a clogging issue. Right. Capacity. That's a lot of water that's coming out. So to me, that's what I would like to look at. I mean, they, they can kind of work at the maintenance side. If I can work from... 
um, from where the water's coming out full. I mean, essentially all the way to the Mohawk, because again, we've said this, you can't upsize one culvert because then you're just transferring the water from one problem. Yep, moving the problem down to the next and, point. Yep. You know, yeah. the one area that kind of knows how to deal with it knows how to deal with it. So you really have to look at it from there all the way to the end. Right. So, yeah. so that brings you back to the original. And so in the absence of any grants, et cetera, to put this in front of the town board to approve something like this for funding. I think um, the mechanism would be to go um, through the highway committee and discuss it as a capital project and get it put in the budget. Yeah. So like, so you have to just come to the highway committee and so who, who makes that proposition to the highway committee? Um, like can one of us show up or a resident show up or? I mean, I you know, those committees are always public. The residents can certainly show up. We're getting okay. a little bit outside of my okay my Understood. box how that works, um, but I mean typically, when when those public meetings are happening, when the highway is talking about its future projects for the next year, during those budget hearings, it's a really good time to say, hey, um, this is a big problem. Can we set aside some now? Can we set aside some later? Um, and that's when they really review it and look at it. They okay. can't. They can't just take it out of an operating budget, but during the budget hearings, that's typically where you would look at funding some long-term projects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if I'm saying something, I'm just, that's my <laughs> understanding of how it works because planning doesn't really do any of those big um, long-term projects like that. Okay, so have Okay, any other comments or questions for, for anybody or planning department, legal, anything? I had a couple things. Okay. <clears throat> um, one of the things I wanted, to do working, you know, from the planning board perspective with the planning department is maybe establish a deadline for applicants getting information in so that we can get the agendas out. Um, I'm not specifically calling out any specific applicant, but there's a balance between what we do to try to be accommodating and also getting a lot of information within a two week period, sometimes three week period. Um, sometimes it's good intentions by the applicants to try to get additional information, whether it's the rendering, or like what, what Brett brought today, I think is extremely helpful. That's a good additional piece of information. It would've been great to see it. See it this part of the package, but again, he, he presented it very well. And the other times I think it's it, it's just timing on the applicant. So, I, I mean, I don't know what it takes for the planning department if they have a an internal thing they wanna talk about and then maybe come back. And it would be nice to just see that hard deadline put on there so that it's publicly known and all the applicants are all working under the same the same thing and it would give us uh, also some internal time to do things if necessary yep. um when we are developing the agendas and, and getting them posted you know by that you know friday afternoon yep i think that should apply well mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a really good idea i know yeah. clark and i have talked about that a little um if we have a light agenda next month which i think we will um I think maybe Clark and Trisha and I can get together and come up with a proposal that maybe we could bring to the planning board for your review. Mm -hmm. And I think discussing it publicly, potentially, you know, adopting it as a planning board policy mm -hmm. would go a long ways in us. Nope. So that would be the goal yeah. would yeah. be to yeah. make it a policy yeah. as opposed to modifying something in the code? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's really <clears throat> not in the code, but yeah. I think, and Elena can jump in here, but I think if we, if we do it as a public policy, you know, adopted, yeah, it's not in the code. I would say it would be more of a policy. Yeah. Okay. And I might add that you know, Clark and I have been talking about this for some time now, and Dave and I have talked about it, so nothing new. And if you look at some of the other towns, I believe Clifton Park and Half Moon, right on their agenda, it says information for the next meeting has to be submitted by, and it says the date right on it. Yeah. So. And I will note your predecessors actually had deadlines. So, yeah. My predecessors was 10 days, which Clark and I try to stick to. Well, and then it, it was like no later than noon on the Friday before the meeting. Was Kathy? Yeah, and sometimes if something came in and it was brief enough and it was something we've really been waiting for and the project could go forward without one thing, they might slide it in, either get it in the packet or have it on the table when we got to the meeting. But they did really try to stick with it because, you know, the packets had to go out Friday. And I think the bad thing about doing things over the internet is that you don't have that same time constraint. Mm. It can be. 
And no. it, you simply say if it's at the policy. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, but the other thing, as far as policy wise, that we want to add in there is a lot of times we wait to collect the TDE fees until a couple meetings in. And that has become problematic just internally. So for setting forth policies, I think it would be really helpful um, just for any project that comes forward. They have their subdivision application fee, and then we just have a general uh, TDE fee that we collect early on. If it needs to be upped, great. If we don't spend it all, it goes back to them. But actually collecting their TDE fee sort of upon yeah. application um, so that we can get started um, with the TDE earlier, we thought would be very helpful too. Great. I think, yeah, if there's anything else you got, I'll put it on the list too. Okay. To, yeah, oh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I clarification. Are there Kevin, I, I'd just like to go on the record as saying I completely agree with this discussion. Hang on, Clark, one second. Ms. Gold is speaking right now. Hang on, one second. Yeah, I was just clarifying, are there any projects that don't go to a TV? And the answer was some. Okay, but you wouldn't collect the fee on those. Okay. Okay, Mr. Clark, or Mr. Henry, sorry. I keep saying her. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kevin. I just wanted to say I completely agree with this. This is totally within our control. All we need to do is set a deadline and stick to it. We just established our deadline as one o'clock on Saturday to accept materials. And I think we all agree that's crazy. We have to stop doing that. And yep. we're gonna have an upset applicant at some time, but we have to draw the line and stick to our gun. It's as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, they'll change their behaviors. It's a matter of time. Well, it ends up driving, I would think it would drive you crazy. You're constantly sending us things at the last minute. And yeah. I don't mind, but when I look at some of the times that this stuff comes through, I'm like, this woman never sleeps. We have to look at it, too. I mean, yeah. yeah. Right, <laughs> right. Clark, I think one o'clock is just fine as long as it's two weeks before the <laughs> scheduled meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, and I think exactly. a lot of it is done with good intentions yeah. and and people, you know, sometimes just two weeks is not a long time between a big project. And I understand that. But, you know, not all of us have access to our computers on Mondays or specifically over the weekends. Or Friday. And, you know, I'm constantly checking the updates or I get home to make sure that I can get here in time to have the latest. And if there's a quick exactly. email, you want to try to be as up to speed as possible. And I think this, whatever the deadline becomes... You know, we can yeah. we can talk about it and discuss it and come up with a, yeah. something reasonable. In the long run, it, this will make the process, I think, better for the public and better for the yep. applicants. Agreed. The fundamental thing here is that it does affect the quality of our decision. Mm -hmm. Like those drawings that you were showing that Brett sent over the weekend, okay. I, I really felt we should have had them in front of us. Yeah. And not to mention then the burden on the planning board. Yep. Uh, the planning department. Yeah. I think the deadline should be sometime early Friday. Been new, yeah, and I would go with you know what you and Clark and whoever worked out, yeah, yeah. And just to, I mean, maybe just to follow up on what Chairman Walsh had said, um, is we we don't accept that data anymore. But if, for instance, Brett had those drawings, would he be allowed to show up at the meeting? They weren't in the yes. packet. Do we not allow? I, them? I think he could talk about them, but we can't we can't utilize it in any decision right. because we haven't had a chance to, to validate or review it. That's all. So if that data that they present as an update potentially impacts the decision and the decision is yeah. scheduled, we just have to wait on the decision. Exactly. Yeah. And I do think Friday before the meeting is still too tight. I think it. I think she's actually saying the. Yes. The oh yeah. The pre ten days before. Yeah. yeah. The Friday before the meeting. Yes. Yeah. A week before. Right oh, that's yeah. what we've always. It's like done. ten days. Yeah. That's right. It's a week. We're saying ten days. Yeah. It's a week plus a couple of days, right? So. That's like. Okay. So it would be the Friday. So this, uh, this, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Friday before the pack, the Friday is the pack. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's still too soon for me, but. That seems weird. Well, let, why don't we let planning yeah. Yeah. talk amongst yeah. there, there's other There's, there's other Maybe tiers to this. Maybe something today, in the right? middle. Yeah. 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 Maybe Wednesday. All right. Um, and then just a quick update. The comp plan's been meeting. Um, it's looking for a new zoning board. Yeah. Uh, I'm burning through those guys real quick. Um, and uh, there was a presentation to the town board basically explaining, you know, what the, the general um, goal is for the updates. Um, there's going to be some public outreach things that we're talking about scheduling. So we'll keep you guys abreast of those. And then um, we are just starting to get into the issue areas of, of the comprehensive plan and the, and the review and up. 
I guess the upgrading of, of those. So a lot of work to be done. It's a big document. Um, but again, I think the points where we'll be reaching out to the different boards and committees for some input on specific things and I uh, look forward to your feedback. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody? Anything else? All right. How about motion to adjourn? So moved. Move the motion to adjourn by Ms. Gold. I have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Drescher. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.